The Audio Boy Project. A decentralized anti-authoritarian based initiative focused on creating a library of audiobooks for truth seekers and free speech advocates. All content on this channel is free to download, share, and repost. Your support is much appreciated. Truth, audiobooks, for the people. December 11th, 1990. For many years, we have tolerated in America a syndicate of organized criminals whose power is now reaching unparalleled heights. Tonight, the mafia, not a movie, the real thing. The personal suffering they cause to our society in human and fiscal terms climate of lawlessness that its very existence fosters has made this network of professional criminals a costly and tragic part of our history. Here in New York, it was said you could hardly do business, transport anything, build a building without the mob somehow taking a piece of the action. Today, the power of organized crime reaches into every segment of our society. Salvatore Gravano, Sammy the Bull, the underboss, the second in command of the most powerful mob family in America. The reasons for the mob's success are clear. Organization and discipline, vows of secrecy and loyalty, insulation of its leaders from direct criminal involvement, bribery and corruption of law enforcement and public officials, violence and threats, against those who would testify or resist this criminal conspiracy, all have contributed to the protective curtain of silence that surrounds its activities. For years, the FBI has been watching and listening to the mob street corner meeting. The time has come to cripple the power of the mob in America. For the first time ever, Sammy the Bull Gravano tells his story. This is our thing. Vincent the Chin Giganti. Chin Giganti is extremely dangerous. He ran the Genovese family with an iron hand. No games with him. He was so dangerous that he didn't allow people to say his name. They called him Chin because if you referred to him, you would touch your chin so the other person knew who you were talking about. You didn't want to get caught on tape saying his name. He was extremely powerful. Frankie DeChico is a friend of mine. He's a captain in the Gambino family. Very, very powerful captain. His father was a made guy. He was in the same crew I was in. His uncle was a captain. He was well, well respected and feared. He was respected because he was always for the underdog. And I grew up with him, so we were extremely close. On April 13th, 1986, we went to a club on 86th Street. Me and Frankie went there. A made guy in the Lucchese family, a guy named Frankie Hartz, came in he asked Frankie for a lawyer's card. So Frankie went immediately into his wallet to give it to him. And he said, I don't have it, it must be in the car. I said, Frankie, you want me to go get it? He said, no, I'll get it. And he walked across the street with Frankie Hartz. He opened the door of his car and he sat into the car, the passenger side sideways and opened the glove compartment while he was talking to Frankie Hartz, who was standing right next to the car. The next thing, there was this huge explosion that rocked the whole neighborhood. Windows broke. I never even heard an explosion like that. I came out of the club, so did at least 20, 30 guys. I went to grab him to pull him away from the car. As I pulled him a little bit, one of his legs seemed to be detached. Same thing with one of his arms. When I went under him, 
there was no part of his body left. My hand went right through, almost to the outside part of his stomach. So my hand was actually in his body. And that started us thinking about where could this have come from? Picking him up, a lifelong friend of mine, was sickening how I saw him dead. It's not like he was shot. It's not like things that we were used to. He was completely blown away. After months of thinking about this and investigating it, most of us came to the conclusion the only one who had the connections, the balls to do this would be Vincent the Chin Gigante. John Gotti called me to a private meeting, just me and him. And he said, I think you're right, Sammy. I believe it's Chin Gigante. I said, you want me to kill the boss of the Genovese family now? Yes, take him out. Actually, it was music to my ears. And I'll give you a reason why. When I knelt at Frankie's funeral, I knelt at this coffin and I whispered to him, Frankie, I'll never let this go. I will kill who did this. I will kill everyone who was involved. I will kill everybody who knew about it in advance. I was gonna now live up to my oath to him. This was extremely important to me. I left the meeting and I started to assemble people that I would use. I kept this very low key, but I designed who would stay on one corner with a gun, who would drive a crash car, who would drive a backup car. And a van would come, pull up to his club, the door would open, and someone would come out and kill Chin and whoever the fuck he was with, with that Uzi machine gun. One of my guys said, Sammy, who, who'll be the shooter? I said, me this time, me. I owe this motherfucker. But this hit was enormous. It was bigger than the Castellano hit was, for one reason. When we killed Castellano and Tommy Bellotti in front of Sparks Steakhouse, it was an internal thing. Now, this was killing a boss of another family. To me, it was time to get even for Frankie De Chico. For me, it was time to live up to what I told him in a coffin. But one day, John called me in, and he told me the hits off were shit. Put it on the side. There's an indictment that came down. I'm on the indictment with others. I'm not sure if you're on it. Go on the lamb. FBI case agent George Gabriel. When we're ready to do the indictments, they got wind of something. And next thing we hear, Sammy's on the lam because they were convinced we were going to be taking him down and he wanted Sammy out there to be in a position to run things. I always wanted to be an FBI agent. All other criminal matters, you're really reactive, if you will. The crime has to happen for you to open a case. With organized crime, they're doing it while you're watching them. I mean, they're walking criminals. And the challenge there is, I mean, yes, you're going to prosecute on something that happened, but it's, how do you stop it? 
In New York, we had five organized crime families. We're the bad guys in these neighborhoods. We're not the good guys. The office had eight organized crime squads. There was one squad dedicated to each of the five families. Typically, the squads had eight to 13 guys. The Gambino squad, we had about 13 at our heyday. Now, that may sound like a lot of people, but when you figure the family had a membership of about 250 made guys, and most made guys have half a dozen guys around them, you're talking well over 400 people that you've got to be targeting. You only have 13 guys to do it. So you have to be real selective in who you go after. Most of the criminal conduct in organized crime, especially at the level of the hierarchy, which is the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere, is really talking, right? They're ordering crimes. They're not committing them themselves. So for me to put them in jail, I have to catch them where they're talking. The Ravenite Club is where John made everybody show up to pay respect to him. So John, again, kind of got in the face of organized crime, if you will, where this stuff is supposed to happen in secret. He brought it into the daylight. If you needed to talk to the boss, that's where you went to meet him. The problem is, it may be easy to bug the club, but not the best conversations are happening there. We had to win. We had to start really dismantling it. If you take this guy down, you potentially take everything down. For electronic surveillance, that's considered the most invasive tactic. So you have to show you've exhausted everything else. And short of a, a putting a bug someplace would be an undercover operation. And those typically don't work with the mob. So people, I think, think you, you put a bug someplace and you just decide you're going to do it. I mean, it's a complicated order. You have to file an affidavit with the judge, and the affidavit has to show enough convincing information that stops just short of probable cause, which is what it takes to indict somebody. The significance of the Ravenite Club, it became John's headquarters. The focus of that investigation was to find the right spots to put the bugs to get the best conversations having those really good criminal conversations at the highest level. So we, we tried the Ravenite, we tried the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. For a while, we heard he had an office in Midtown in a uh, garment center building. We tried putting bugs in there. He was going to all these places, but the, the better conversations weren't happening. The audibility, which is always a problem, was terrible. Overall, I was bugging him for about 60 months at different locations trying to find the right place. We started noticing John's voice disappearing in the club, and he wasn't coming outside because we had surveillance on the outside. We heard there was an internal door that he was just stepping out into the back in a hallway there. So we actually bugged the hallway for a while, and we got a couple of more conversations. Then all of a sudden, we'd hear footsteps going upstairs, and the voices would disappear again. And we learned that he was going to an apartment. Years ago, there was a guy by the name of Mike Sorelli, he was a Gambino guy. I think he owned the building. And he was the caretaker of the club, which was another way they could kind of protect it and secure it. Well, he passed, but his wife still had an apartment upstairs. And his nephew, Norman DuPont, was the current caretaker of the club. And John arranged that when he wanted to have a really secret conversation, He'd go up and tell his aunt, go get a cup of coffee someplace. And she'd clear out and they'd get access to the apartment. So we, we learned about that. We were able to kind of verify it uh, for an affidavit. It just took months to be able to get in there because it wasn't an easy place to go in. I think we go about three weeks after we put the bugs in with no conversations. We don't hear anything. And November 29th, I get a call, I'm at home, and, and all I hear is they're up in the apartment and the audibility is good. I literally couldn't wait to get in the office the next day to listen to the tapes. I think I, I kept calling back to the plant being a pain in the ass. And, you know, just, you know, yeah, we're getting tidbits. 
They're talking about killing and, you know, this and that. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So, you know, get in the next day to listen to it. And, hey, the clarity was fantastic. And I'm listening to this and I was convinced he's done. We got five conversations. The last one was in May of 90. The first one was November of 89. You only got five conversations in that time span. But what shocked me even more was the first conversation, and we're talking almost five years after they killed Paul, four years after, it's why they killed Paul Castellano. I mean, John's on a, almost an hour diatribe about why Paul Castellano got whacked without saying Paul's name, but it was clear who they were talking about. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, by the second, third one, there was no doubt. The guy's going to jail for life. I mean, almost to the point where we were concerned the judge was going to say, how much more do you need? We have an indictment, as far as I'm concerned. John's trying to find out. He's tasking guys, go speak to your lawyers, go speak to people. We hear there's a big one coming. We don't know who's involved. It's a cat and mouse game. All to kind of preserve what was going on and, and when we were going to do stuff. He wasn't sure what the hell was going on. In Gotti's case, we had it all presented. We were starting to move forward to getting ready to come down with our arrests and plan around it. The minute you issue it, it becomes public record at some point that there's an arrest warrant out there, and we didn't want this out. We know for sure Sammy's gone. So we're like, all right, we're going to put this all on hold. We'll do whatever we've got to do in the meantime. He's got to come back sooner or later. The Ravenite was the ideal place to take these guys down. It was symbolic. It was John's place. So we were taking him out there. And we wanted to be able to arrest all of them at the same time. And that was the one place we could do it. December 10th, 1990. While I'm on the lam, Louis Susenti, my bodyguard driver, comes to me and says, John wants me to come in. He wants me to come in and meet him at the club in Little Italy. It was always FBI or news trucks or media. Didn't make sense that I was gonna go there. But the boss is the boss. I went home that night, came in, me and my wife hugged. I had a full beard, took a shower, shaved. And the next day I got up got dressed and got ready to go down to Mulberry Street that afternoon. We get word that Sammy's coming back. The plan is, as soon as we confirm that he's in town, I'll go get the indictments and we're gonna just pick him up. I would go into the club, meet with John, and then probably go back on the lamp. So I go and I start getting the indictment. I'm in Brooklyn working with the U.S. attorney and the, and the grand jury. So I get him. We pulled up. We got out of the car. We walked to the club, opened the door, walked in. And I, all the people in the club were made guys, associates. They all knew who I was. Hey, Sammy, how you doing? How, how's things? You look great, this and that, all that bullshit. I walked to the back of the club. I shook John's hand and Frankie's hand. I sat down. We hear that Sammy went into the club. And I go running over. So I'm the lead car, and I, you know, I've got everyone lined up behind me. And I'm like, all right, on go, we're going. A couple of minutes passed, the door opened up, and agents came in. We get out of the car, and you just focus on the front door, and, you know, and there's wise guys all over the place, and just go bursting in. I'm not even in a vest. I mean, I'm just in a jacket. I'm armed, obviously. I wasn't concerned that any violence was going to happen. These guys are not that stupid. Now, one agent I remember, he was George Gabriel. He was a street agent, big agent. He came in, I think, with another guy. They parted like Moses parted the sea. I mean, these guys just got out of the way when I got in there. They were extremely compliant. You know, on any other day, these guys would kill anybody. But in that atmosphere, environment, that wasn't going to happen. There wasn't going to be a problem. That is the first time I ever set foot in the Ravenite Social Club. Short time went by, and more guys came, police cars came, 
NYPD. I know it probably about 30 of these wise guys. I'm not going to say it's not intimidating, but, you know, it's. A, I, I guess when you're in the moment, you're in the moment, and that's all there is to it. They wanted a bus to hold three of us together. This was the organized crime case, really, for the Bureau at that time. I mean, we had several others, but this was the target that had to be gotten. They told all the people in the club, it's got nothing to do with you guys. Give us your ID, we'll take your name, and you can leave. It has nothing to do with you. I said, listen, everybody's going to get to walk out of here. I want you to just, you know, take your time. You give these guys your name. Whatever they ask you, you answer, and you're going to get to go. And then when you're all done, we're going to take these three with us. George Gabriel come over and told John, you can't leave, John. You're under arrest. You, Sammy, you're under arrest as well. You too, Frankie Lucasio. You know, John's sitting at his round table and Frankie and Sammy are there. You know, and, and John's the typical wise as Well, you know, we knew you were coming. I said, well, how come you didn't tell Sammy? You guys are in suits. He's in a jacket. Come on. He didn't get the word? John always had these cutesy little remarks and stuff. And he says, Norman, give me Sammy and Frankie a cup of coffee. I'm not leaving until we're done with the coffee. And he's just kind of jawboning, ah, you know, I'm going to beat this one too. I'll be home. Don't worry about it. He's talking to Frankie and Sammy, probably nervous. I looked at George Gabriel. He was very quiet, very polite. They still have no idea what they're being indicted for at that point, what the significance is. And it's not until I get him out of the club and in the car that we even have that kind of conversation. We had our coffee and they took us out and put us in separate cars. I was in one car. John Gotti was in one car, I believe, with George Gabriel. And Frankie Lucasio got into another car. We got everybody out. Now we just, it's time to go process these guys. Well, there was two FBI agents that were assigned to me. They even had their own office in Staten Island that dealt with just me. They were the guys, Frank and Maddie, actually, they called them the twins because you saw one, you always saw the other one. They used to watch me all the time. I got to know them over the years of being watched. They cuffed me, and they took me in their car. When we bring these guys out of the club after the arrests, John's going with me, and I had a detective that was in my car and my partner. So we put John in the back. Frank Lacasio goes with Billy Noon and, uh, and Walter Takano. Sammy goes with uh, Maddie and Frank. So we got in the car. And I believe it was Frank Spiro, the agent, told me, he said, Sammy, there's no need for us to cuff you. Then he asked me, he said, do you have money on you? I says, yeah, I do. I have a couple of thousand, three, four thousand. Got jewelry? Yeah, I got a pinky ring and a watch. Why? He said, you're not coming out. When they arrest you, you're gonna be staying there. FBI special agent, Frank Spiro. We told Sammy, Sammy, they're going to take all your personal items off you when you get there. So if you want, you can give it to us. We'll make sure we give it to Debbie tomorrow. So he says, I appreciate that, Bo. That's how much they were following us. He's calling my wife like, like he knew her Andre is, Deb. He's calling her. I said, all right. So I gave him the money, less $50. I kept it in my pocket because you got to roll in with something. The MCC is a mile away from where the Ravenite was, so it's not a particularly long ride. And John is instantly jawboning. Well, you know, this I'm going to be out. Ah, this case is nothing and this and that. Nobody wants to put me in jail. Your mother's probably rooting for me. I said, well, you don't know my mother. I mean, she's a Greek immigrant. She doesn't like you. I said, but I tell you what. You know, you really talked a little too much in Mr. Sorelli's apartment. And that shut him up for a second. Because that's when he learned that's where this case was coming from. As we got close to MCC in New York, there was news media. There was a lot more cops, more agents. And they said, Sammy, turn around. We got to cuff you again. We're taking you out. The news media's here. We can't just walk you out. We're not. All right, all right. I turned around. They put the cuffs back on me. And I got out. Detectives and FBI were all around us. And they escorted us into the 
MCC, to the prison. They checked us in and they take, do you have jewelry, do you have money? They did it with John, he had four or 5,000 on him. They did the same thing with Frankie Lucasio. And then they did it with me. I said, I don't have no jewelry on me. And I took out my money, which was $50. John looked at me and said, that's all you got on you was $50? I wasn't about to tell him I gave it to the agents. So I said, yeah, that's all I got. So he said, Sammy, remind me, when we beat this case, I got to give you a raise. The guards laughed, the FBI agents laughed. John always had the way about him with cutesy little remarks and things, and it was cute. John was able to see how much Sam, Sammy had on him, right, Matty? Yeah. yeah. And FBI Special Agent Matthew Corico. And he, he made a comment. He said, Sammy, you yeah. got to give you a yeah. raise. Yeah. But was he was a, there, everything was nice yeah. and John, John was like Collins on yeah. a cloud. He oh, was yeah. like, oh, all right. You we're know, he had beaten so many raps. John had beaten so many raps. He figured this is just another, another rap. We'll be out of there in no time. But this time he was wrong. We had the goods. Me and him were super tight. We were attached at the hip. I loved the guy. At this point, we were still close. John was smart in, in picking Sammy because Sammy not only had respect from especially the Brooklyn factions of the Gambino family, but he had great interaction and respect with the other families. He was close to Vicar Musso and Gas Pipe, who were the Lucchese guys. Um, he had good ends with the Genovese guys and the Columbos. So there's always disputes between these guys. So you have that ambassador, if you will, who's got the access, the respect to go in and sit down at a beef and kind of come out with a good result. That's value. I mean, you can't put a price on that. Sammy had that. John surrounded himself with killers. And, and Sammy, I mean, he was a known quantity. That was the intimidating thing about having to deal with a guy like that. This was a, a trigger puller. This was a guy who could order a hit, you know, and carry it out. He wasn't one of the street guys that had to be told to go do something. He was a decision maker. Now, granted, you still have to put it on record and stuff, but bottom line was he had the guys here. He could do what he thought he needed to do. It's still intimidating when you're going by these guys because it's not lost on you who and what they are. Sammy, of all of them, oddly enough, I think I was more intimidated because I didn't know him well. Metropolitan Correctional Center. At the beginning, the relationship with John was good. I loved the guy. I didn't have no idea what this indictment was about. We're put on the ninth floor. That whole floor is locked down. Me and John are put in one cell together and we're getting along perfectly. And the government says, we want them held without bail. They're a threat to society. The judge, he points at me and he says, I know him. He's been before me in a tax evasion case, very serious case. I gave him bail and he was here on time every time. Show me how he's a threat to society and the other guys too. The government was forced into a position of saying, okay, we'll make you listen to the tapes. That's basically the first time I hear about tapes. A day or two or three later, they postponed for the government to bring in the tapes. They bring in the tapes and the tapes are devastating. John Gotti is caught on a rant saying things that were totally not true. And I am blown away. Gotti, he is there talking about me, about killing this guy and that guy and taking over the union or taking over this business. And none of it's true. But when I heard this tape, I was devastated. He's betraying 
me behind my back. That's how I'm on this pinch. He knew at that court hearing, when I left, I was the very defiant with him. I was completely devastated listening to this thing. So, he knows I'm, I'm completely pissed. After that day, the judge holds us without bail. We go back in. Mine and John's relationship is extremely shaky now. There's a few more things that happened. My tipping point was John says, I got a way where I could beat this case. He tells me and Frankie, my guys are going to go over all the documents and tapes. We'll take care of that. You guys are not allowed to listen or read them. That's one of the conversations. And I said, John, I'm indicted on two, three murders, a couple of conspiracies to murder. I'm facing life without parole. I can't listen to a tape or read a transcript. I can't fight for my freedom. That's the way it's going to be. The boss is the boss. The boss must go free. The thing I wouldn't think of when I was writing, that was like the unthinkable, the untouchable. And I'm thinking now, that's exactly what he's doing. He's giving me up to the government. Now, what the fuck is the difference whether he's taking the stand, he's backing the tape up? What's the difference what position he's taking? He is now arranging for me to be convicted and do life without parole while he hits the streets. It's a rat move. If you don't want to call him a rat, don't call him a rat. It's a rat move. And I said, think about this, John. Think about it carefully. Is that exactly what you want to happen? It's got to be that way, Sammy. That's just the way it is. You got to go down for me to go out. I said, all right, then let's do it. If this is what this whole thing boiled down to, killing each other, not only killing each other, but we're putting each other away and we're doing fucking unheard of things. If this is goes in Austria, the goes in Austria I lived and killed and did everything under the sun for, without question, without hesitation, I quit. I quit goes in Austria, I quit him, and I got in touch with the FBI. November 1991. I was 20 years old at the time. I remember it as if it was yesterday. There's always some outside hope that somebody's going to flip. We didn't think John could ever do it. That ego was never going to let that happen. Of all the guys, Sammy might be of the mind. As much of a wise guy as he was, he also was a family guy, more so than these other guys. You know, 11 months go by, and word gets sent to Maddie and Frank that Sammy might want to cooperate. Reaching out for the FBI was something I never imagined in my entire life that I would do. I knew at that point my life was over as Salvatore Sammy to Bo Gravano. I would be called a rat, a traitor, an inform. I would be called a million different names. My family would have to live through this horror, but I was done. I had to leave. So when I clearly decide to cooperate, I go into this room with my wife and my daughter. They came in, smiling, kissing me, hugging me. I said, I'm gonna tell you something that is gonna probably rock you. Something you would never expect from me. My daughter, what the? I got in touch with the government. I'm gonna cooperate, I'm gonna flip. I'm gonna get the fuck out of this case. I'm gonna get away from John. When I went up on the visit that time, it was different than every other time. My father had a 
different type of energy. And as soon as he sat down, I remember just feeling like a vibe from him. And I remember he just started off that he's going to do something that goes against everything that he ever taught me to believe in, everything that he believes in. And I probably won't understand it at this time, but hopefully, he, you know, someday I will. And then I just remember him looking at me and he said, I'm going to cooperate with the government. And at that particular moment, I felt like he just stabbed me right in the heart. My daughter went hysterical, crying, and ran out the fucking gate. I was just in shock. It was like a surreal moment because I never expected those words to come out of him. And I remember crying because that's all I wanted to do. And he looked me in the eyes and said, someday you'll understand. I just couldn't. I was like, anything that he was saying to me at that moment was just, I wasn't really even hearing him. I was just building up the anger. It was fear. It was anger. It was hurt. And I honestly felt betrayed by a man that I've trusted my whole life. It's so hard to explain it. I don't even know where the fuck I was. It felt like everything was in slow motion. It wasn't me sitting there talking or watching my daughter. It felt like I was out of my body and I was somewhere else looking at it. And I was actually talking to myself. Sammy, why are you doing this? Why would you do this? That's what it felt like. It didn't feel real. It was so massive to me that I even questioned, maybe I should have just killed myself. It was the, the worst moments I ever had in my life. I had so many bad moments. People dying and all kinds of things. But this had to be amongst one of the worst moments I ever had in my life. I don't even want to talk about it because I'm getting emotional again right now. And I don't want to even talk about it. I don't remember words. No, I don't know. I don't know. Let her explain it, what she felt or said. But that's how I feel right now. I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. Once we take him out, there's no putting him back. This is life and death for him. We've got to talk. What do we think he's going to do? I mean, in my mind, this was the biggest threat to my case. My case was made. I didn't need a witness. These guys were all going to jail. Sammy Gravano can only hurt my case at that time in my mind because he's somebody the defense attorneys can do all sorts of stuff with. You can't question a tape. Comes one day, my name is on a list when the place is packed, they do this thing. They rotate prisoners. They call it uh, Otisville Run. They put 10, 12 prisoners on a chain and they bring them to Otisville Prison to relieve the pressure a little bit. You stay there maybe a month or two and then you come back. They put me on this list. The logistics should be somewhat easy. You still gotta keep it very quiet because there's no doubt the minute the mob finds out this guy's cooperating, he's dead. So a night came where they tell me, you're on the Otisville run. And at the end of the night, they cuff me. They put me on the chain. There's about 10 guys, 12 guys in front of me on this chain. Each guy is leg chained together. I'm in the back. When we get down on the elevator, we're on the main floor, they stop. Sammy was obviously deemed like the threat of threats. They were also concerned that it, this was a ploy for him to just escape from us. So now we're, we're going into a series of conversations of logistically, where are we going to keep this guy? They wanted to just keep him in a prison cell, and I'm like, that, no, that's not going to work. They take my leg chain off of that chain gang. They let the chain gang keep going, and two guys come out from the side in suits. They're FBI agents. They take him out of his cell to bring him down. The whole MCC knows something's going on. And I think John knew within minutes that Sammy was out, and that can only mean that he's flipped. 
When they take me out the side door, this big steel door, it's raining. I can hear helicopters in the background. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of flashing lights, NYPD, everybody's got their lights on, FBI agents all over the place. And there's a, a woman, a female guard, and she looks at me and she says, oh, no, Sidney, oh, God, it's not you. It literally broke my heart. She obviously had tremendous respect for me, and it must have broke her heart to see that I was going out with agents. Although his family was probably foremost in it, he understood from the dealings with John in the MCC while they were listening to the tapes, he saw betrayal. The one tape that puts the murders on Sammy, Sammy's not in the conversation. It's John and Frankie, and it's John railing about Sammy. I got in the car, and like a big motorcade, everything moved with me. All these cars, vehicles, trucks, helicopters, everything moved with me. Word we get back once we take Sammy out is John knew within minutes. And what we heard again, because we're not there to witness any of it, is he just, he lost himself. I mean, he couldn't believe it on some respect. I think more, though, was he understood he was never seeing the light of day. A guy like John, he's not a lawyer. He thinks he could beat everything. Sammy turning on him, and he was the guy who put Sammy in these positions. That just crushed him. We go to a plane. The plane flies down to Virginia. I asked them where I'm going, and they told me, Quantico. And I'm going in this building, and I thought to myself, John Gotti, if anybody would break me, it was you. My love, my trust, everything I, I had in you, you're responsible for this. When I walk into the Quantico, I know my life is over, but this is how it begins. The Rampers in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1959. When I was young, early in my life, 13, 14 years old maybe, I'm, I'm in a gang. There was different gangs in that in those days everywhere. Black gangs, Puerto Rican gangs, you name it. A friend of mine called me not too long ago and was talking about it. He said, Sammy, you remember when we went in and uh, we were taking the initiation? You would get beatings, slapped, you fucking bitch, punched, kicked. I mean, sometimes real good beatings. Your mouth was fucking swolled up. And the answer was all the time, we're gonna toughen you up. And we were doing things that wasn't just normal to everyday gangs. We were already carrying guns, armed robberies, burglaries. We were a little more dangerous than the everyday gang. There was a lot of people who belonged to gangs, not like this gang. This gang was a brutal fucking gang. When you joined this gang, you felt brutalized. It prepared you for different things. New York, 1970. Joe Colucci. Joe Colucci was a bricklayer. He was in the crew with us. He was a hunter, a tough guy. So I really liked him. But what he did, what he was plotting is unthinkable. And he came out with this weird plan on what to do, and it backfired on him. Joe Colucci plotted to kill Shorty Spiro and myself. He went to another crew member for help, a guy named Frankie. Frankie listened to his request and went to Shorty and told him what he was asked to do. That's how this whole thing started. They went right up to the top. The order came down. 
to kill him. I wasn't really sure in my head if I was being goaded into this. I didn't understand why he would want to kill me. And I was asked, who do you want to help you once I agreed to do the hit? I wanted Frank on the hit. I wanted to hear it from him, what happened, what he heard, why he didn't tell me, why he went to Shorty Spiro and not me. I also wanted Tommy Spiro. They agreed to that. And we started plotting to kill Joe Colucci. Where would we kill him? How would we kill him? Frankie went back and told him that he would help him with his plot, his plan to kill me and Shorty. All the information was coming to us. It was my first hit. I was a little green. I didn't know exactly what to do. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1945. My mother and father were legitimate, good people. They prepared me in a lot of ways for a lot of good things, honest things. That made me a little bit different of a gangster. I had some compassion for people. I did have some love and respect for people. Maybe people won't agree, but I, had diff I was a different type of gangster. I had no one in the mafia. No uncles, aunts, cousins, sisters, brothers, nobody in the mafia. To excel in the mafia without brothers, fathers, uncles, or somebody is extremely difficult. I excelled in the mafia from all my other training, my family, learning respect, learning honor, learning something different, and the gang structure. So when I got into the mafia, I believe I excelled because of all that back history. My father's name was uh, Gelando in Italian, but everybody called him Jerry over here. My mother was called Katie, so Jerry and Katie. Originally, there was five of us. Before I was born, my brother, Frankie Gravano, died. One of my sisters was a twin. She died. I was left with two sisters. One of them was nine years older than me. One of them was five years older than me. And they were, I was like their little toy. They would hover around me and they almost like played house with me, you know, took care of me. They were, it was almost like having three mothers. My mother was a seamstress. My father was a painter. And they worked long, long hours. I got in trouble most of my life. I literally used to break their heart. I could see the pain in their face when every time I fucked up. They didn't hit me, and then my father never raised his hands to me. My mother would hit me with a broom and a stick and anything she could get her hands on. But my father never hit me. They wanted the best for me and to be good. But I was a fuck up. I, I absolutely loved my parents. I adored them. I never told them I was in the life I don't think they officially knew I was in the life. Because when I was younger, I, I was really tough with my hands. I had a lot of respect in the neighborhood. People wouldn't fuck with me. My father, I heard him telling my mother one time, he's just a bad kid. He's just that way. Some kids are, are born and raised that way. We didn't raise him that way, but that's in him. So he just knew I was a tough kid, a bad kid. And uh, I was well respected, feared, probably at the same time. I remember going to church one time with my father on a Sunday, and we went down the block. On the corner, there was a bar. And almost like that movie, Goodfellas, there was guys dressed in suits and hanging out. Cop car parked there. They were talking to them. In right in front of the cops, they're shooting dice and they're, you know, they're the heavyweights. Everybody looked up to these people in the neighborhood. So my father told me when I asked him, who are they, that? He said, they're bad guys. They don't work. They're not like us. 
but they're our bad guys. Respect them all the time. Never tell on them. Never go against them. They help us when we're in trouble. Back then, when they came from Sicily especially, they didn't trust the government. They didn't trust police. They didn't trust. They had those people they would run to. My father had problems and ran to them a few times. He had gumbadas that he knew from Sicily, and they came over. They were made guys. My father had nothing to do with the life, but if he had a problem, he couldn't go to them. So they, to me, were like gods. The way they walked around, they had beautiful women, beautiful cars, beautiful clothes, diamond pinky rings, and they were looked up to by just about everybody. I think I remember my father asking me, because his gumbada, Suvido, was a made guy, and when he had problems, he would go to his gumbada, Suvido. And I remember my father asking me one time, you never, you never hooked up, right? So that's what he mean, that hooked up. Like Suvido, you never went over there. Nah. Nah, I'm good like I am. I know a pe- couple of people like that. Don't worry about it. February 28th, 1970. One night, we went out drinking. We went to an after-hour club. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning. We were ready. We'd been hunting him for a while. This was the perfect time. We went to a, a cafeteria that's open 24 hours a day. The famous cafeteria. That was the name of it on 86th Street. When Joe went downstairs and more or less like down the staircase into the basement where the men's room was, when we leave, Tom, you get behind the wheel and drive. Frank, you get in the back. I'll get in the back as well. That'll put Joey in the front, the passenger seat and I'll take them out. Part of the life, there's a code, a strong code. When it comes from the top, they tell you to do something. And you have to do it. That's part of the code of the mafia. If you refuse, you can be killed. In most cases, you will be. There's no I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. And in this code, this is all to protect Gozenostra. I never woke up in the morning and said, I want to kill somebody or thought about killing somebody. I never killed a woman or a child. It was all part of the life. That's the code. You must listen to the boss. There's no questions about it. There's no arguing. There's no talking about it. You could put a position in to try to save the person who's going to get killed. And they'll listen to you. Hopefully. But if they take a position that you you presented your case, now go kill them. That's it. There's no more discussion about it. The only discussion is, I have to hunt and kill this person. And I'm not talking strictly about myself. That's the life for everybody who's in the life. Now, at that time, I was an associate. Once you become made, then it's it's written in granite. As I went on with the life, I've learned that the hardest part of doing a hit is putting it together. The planning, the plotting, deception. Pulling the trigger is the easy part. You're told to sit here and pull the trigger. You pull the trigger. But it's pulling it off, the deception of it. And not getting caught. That's the the hard part. Now, they'll use friends, 
people who are close to you, people will ask why. Because it makes the hit easier. You got the guy in your grasp. Most of the time, you hang out with him. So you're going out drinking with him. You're going to the club with him. You're always around him. So you're going to be given the contract, not somebody he knows a no coming from left field. Then the hit becomes harder to pull off. So that's the way the mafia functions. The only, only justification you get for this is that we all know the rules. So when you're going to get killed as much as I like you or love you, you broke the rules, bro. I'm going to get the same thing if I break the rules. The plan went pretty solid. Joey came back. We were ready to go. We were drinking. He was a little drunk, I think. But he was still on guard. He was a hunter as well. When we got to the car, Tommy got in to drive the car. When Frankie was going to get in to sit behind Tommy, Joey told him, hold up, Frankie. Sammy, you get in the car and sit behind Tommy. Frankie, you sit behind me. I guess it made him feel a little more confident. The car took off. The windows were rolled up. We were driving down the street. There was a Beatles song. I believe it was Let It Be. Tommy had it blasting loud, like as if to cover a noise or something. I went in my waistband and pulled out a 38. I put the gun to the back of his head and I pulled the trigger. Nothing seemed to happen. It shocked me. Why didn't anything happen? Was something wrong with the gun? I was confused. The sound of the gun was enormous with the window shut. It sounded like a cannon went off. The smell of the gunpowder. I still till today could smell it. I pulled the trigger again. He started to slide over towards the driver, down and to the side. I told Tommy, go to the highway. And I told him where to go. It was uh, an area a little bit out of Brooklyn, Bensonhurst. There were fancy homes with lawns, and it was quiet, well-to-do neighborhood. I told him to get off the highway over there and go into the side streets. Like I said, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. Maybe it was 4.10 now. I saw a block. Tree-lined, quiet. I told him, pull over. He pulled over in front of a house. It was a two-door car. It was my car. I told Tommy, open the door and push him out. He was completely shooken up, nervous. Sammy, he's dead. I know he's fucking dead. Instead of arguing, I told Frankie, open up the window. It wasn't even electric windows. It was rolling down the window. I crawled over Frankie and out the window. I went to the door, opened the door. Joey was a big guy, pretty heavy. I put one arm around his neck, one arm under his legs. I picked him up. It felt like he weighed a thousand pounds. Dead weight feels different. I took him out of the car and put him in front of the house on the grass. And I got back into the car. My hand on the seat slid. There was a puddle of blood. My hand, 
My clothes were full of blood now. I told him, hold up. I rolled the window down. Pointed the gun out the window. And I shot him three more times. Then I told Tommy, go forward, don't speed, don't go through lights, and let's go back to the neighborhood. We'll stop by the ocean, I'll get rid of the gun, and then we'll clean the car. We did that. I didn't know back then that I was making a mistake. You can't clean the blood completely out of a car. I should have just burnt it. But it was my first hit. I didn't know exactly what I was doing. Well, we got rid of the gun. We came back. We cleaned up the car. And then we went up into an apartment where Tommy and his brother Matty and his family lived. And I was staying there on occasion. And we went into the house. I was totally exhausted. I went into the shower to take a shower. I saw in movies when people did a murder, they would get nervous, and sweat, and shake, and I thought this would happen to me. And I was waiting for it to happen. But I was letting the water run on me. It didn't happen. I didn't feel anything. I came out of the shower and went into the bedroom and got into bed. I fell asleep in a matter of seconds. I slept like a baby the entire night. I got up in the morning and there was confusion in the apartment. People coming in, girls, guys. Oh my God, Joe Colucci was killed last night. It's in the newspapers. I remember getting up and one of the girls, the younger girls used to hang with us. And I said, did they... Catch who did it? She says, I don't know. It just said that he was killed. I don't think so. We got dressed and we went down to the corner where we would hang out. Everybody was there, people talking, all kinds of stuff going on. Tommy wasn't there. He left to go meet his uncle, Jody Spiro. I remember... It was like everything went into slow motion. It was like I wasn't there. It was like I was up further, looking at everybody, talking and listening to them. I started to think, why isn't this bothering me? Why don't I feel guilt, remorse? Why don't I feel anything? I did feel something. I felt I had power over life and death. My adrenaline was running like crazy. I knew this was part of the life of the mafia. My concentration was broke when Tommy came back and said, Shorty's going to pick us up. We got to go downtown Brooklyn where Carmine Persico, who was a captain directly below Joe Colombo. I got in the car. Shorty told me, my nephew told me everything. You did a great job. We're going to go down and talk to Carmine. I don't want you to say nothing, Sammy. Don't talk. My nephew will explain the whole thing. I said, okay. That's what we did. We went down there. Tommy explained every little detail that happened, leaving out the detail that he didn't want to push him out of the car, that he was nervous or scared or whatever it may be. We came back to the neighborhood and there was, we saw the family because we all knew each other. Telling them, don't worry about it. We'll get whoever did this and faking it. And that kind of bothered me a little bit. 
I know the sister. I know the family. But that was the life that I was in. I understood it now more than ever. That night in the car, there's no question it was life-changing for me. I was a tough kid with my hands. I never killed anybody. I don't think I'm a bad person or was a bad person. Like I said, I feel I felt power over certain things. I felt now I belong to Gozanostra. At some point early in my life, I'm going to die or I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life. I knew it. Knowing those things and being in the life and starting to really understand the life more and more, I became ruthless. I became fearless. I thought I'm going to die anyway or go to prison. That's the life, and I'm in it. It's like being a soldier. You could train. When you go to Vietnam and fight, you say to yourself, I don't know if I'm ever coming home. There's other guys shooting at me. This is fucking for real. This isn't a game. This isn't a fist fight. This is a war. I'm in that war. Rosa Nostra became everything to me. It became my government, my country, my God. It became everything to me. Later, we went to the funeral. And uh, again, I just didn't feel much. At first, I thought, am I sick? Is this something wrong that I don't have feelings or I don't have things? I have tons of feelings for people in all different kinds of ways. But I felt maybe a piece of me died that night. I don't know. I really don't know. I know one thing. That night, I became a professional killer. Benzenhurst, Brooklyn, 1959. When I was young, early in my life, I was uh, dyslexic. I screwed up in school, something awful. I got in trouble a whole bunch of times. One time I got caught playing hooky with a bunch of my friends, and I went in, and there was truant officers and principal, and he was fucking talking to the teachers and really bullshitting about us, but not about us, about me. He was talking about our families and grease balls, and this is how they are, these people. I listened to it. The word greaseball didn't bother me. It's a, so, a ra racist remark against Italians. It didn't bother me. We used that word ourselves. It, it didn't affect me all that much. It bothered me that they were talking about my mother and father. And I got up and I told him, bro, I did this. I played hooky. Has them, they're my mother and father working hard every day. They're good people. I did this. What do you want? Stay away from my mother and father. He said something to the teachers again. He like bypassed me and just said, see how these fucking grease balls are? And I cracked him a fucking shot with everything I had, and I broke his jaw. I got thrown out of that junior high school, shallow junior high school. I was left back twice in the fourth grade, the seventh grade. I was already a total fuck up in school. They didn't know what that was that it was a learning disability, not you were fucking stupid or fucking anything else. They didn't know how to deal with it back then. Benzenhurst, Brooklyn, 1969. Well, the early days, it was almost like Goodfellas. We, I started going into uh, the houses. We lived together, ate together, hung out together. It was similar to the Rampers, but... It was on a whole nother level. I could give you an example of 
one thing that happened. I was still friendly with my friends. And we decided to do a bank robbery. One of my friends told me about a guard comes out of an armored truck, goes in a back door, it was a big metal door, and he goes in and he gets money from the bank and he brings it out. He comes down a hallway and he brings it into the armored truck and they take off and whatever they do with it. And uh, he had an inside guy who would leave the door unlocked, slightly open. So I could go into the bank in that hallway, not into the actual bank where the people were, but into that hallway, get the guy who as he was coming out and take him. I told my friends and we all decided to do this. I told my friends to watch the door, keep it open, and watch my back. I'll go into the bank after he's gone for a couple of seconds, and I'll take him, and then I'll come out. We did that. I went in, I prepared myself the way the whole circular hallway he couldn't see me until he made a little bit of a turn. I would pull out the gun and uh, take the bag away from him. Everything was working perfect. I heard the click of the door, the inside door. The gun was out. I was pointing it in the direction. The only thing that went a little crazy was it wasn't one guard. There was three of them. As soon as they saw me, they froze. They put their hands towards their guns. My gun was already out. And I just yelled to them, if you go for that gun, I'll kill you. They froze a little bit. Push the bags over here. I really didn't even give a shit about the bags anymore. I was in trouble. I knew I couldn't turn my back to run out. They would pull those guns out and I would be finished. They kicked over the bags. I grabbed one of the bags, maybe two. One of them I half dropped. I was very nervous, probably a little scared. I knew I was in way over my head. I backed up and backed up. I told them to get down. They got down to their knee. Their hands were away from the gun. I could make my move. I made my move. I went through the outside door, slammed the door fucking shut. I saw as I was just about doing this, that they were definitely going for the guns. I screamed to my friends, run, run, come on, I can't. I felt the pressure of the door. They were pushing, they were trying to push this metal door open. I had my foot against it. I couldn't make this move. I knew as soon as I let go in this door, this door would come flying open and I would be shot. I didn't know what the fuck to do. It was 86th Street, a lot of people walking. I saw a little pack of people coming down and I thought to myself, if I let go of this door and fuck the money and just run right through that pack, maybe when they come out, there'll be too many people and they'd be afraid to shoot. <sighs> They're screaming to me, my friends, and I'm screaming to them. Just go. They're running, but they're looking back like they don't want to leave me. 
And uh, finally, I make the move. I let go of the door. I run straight for the pack. I could hear the door opening. I run right through the pack of people. No shots. I run to the corner. I make a quick turn, and there's a guy there, and he yells to me. I don't know who the fuck this guy is. Sammy, come in the house. Come on, I got you. I don't know what else to do, but listen to him. He knew my name, and he's doing something. i not trying to stop me. And I run into this two, three, four family home. We run up the stairs. And he tells me, give me the gun. I'll put it away. I'm so confused. I'm thinking, trying to think my way out of this situation. I decide not to give him the gun. I don't know who the fuck this guy is. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm not going to give him the gun. I don't give him the gun, and he tells me, I'll go down and check what's going on. He mentions one of the guys. I don't remember who the fuck he mentioned, but he mentions one of them. I got you, bro. Don't worry about nothing. You could hide in this upon my apartment. He leaves. A matter of minutes, he's back. I'm thinking about putting the gun and hiding it in his house. He says, there's a lot of police. Not a big deal. I think it's half over. There's cops all over the place, people talking, but they don't know. They're not coming over here. They're not coming here. Leave me the gun and just walk out and go back to where you hang out. It's not too far from this bank. I could walk there. I decide to do that. But again, I decide not to leave the gun. I don't want to give up the gun. I leave the house, the house and I go to the corner where we hang out. My friends are there, what the fuck happened? And I'm telling them what happened. I said, bro, I couldn't let go of the door. I couldn't really grab every fucking thing. I just, there's three guys I walked into. There was supposed to be one. It would have been easy. I could have walked right over to him and took the gun. I can't take guns away, get that close to three guys and try to take their guns. So it's over. A couple of days goes by and uh, I walk out of the luncheonette, me and Lenny DeMoe, I get into a car. The car is surrounded with 10, 15 guys. Everybody's screaming with guns pointing at us. Don't move, don't move. I think I'm about to be killed. But I'm not. They're cops. I'm arrested for bank robbery. The guard picked my picture out of a mug book. Shorty calls me when I get out. And he tells me, come on, Persico wants to see me. I get in the car and I go down to see Carmine Persico. And uh, he tells me, you got an angel watching over you. I said, okay, why? He said, the God is Macintosh. Macintosh was one of his top shooters. Macintosh is a cousin to the God who picked you out of the mug book. We could take care of this. Wow, this is, yeah, this is heavenly. He says he wants $10,000. And I'm going to give him the $10,000 for you and you loan me the 10000 I says, that's great. Come on, I, I don't even know how to thank you. Yeah, this is great. He says, okay, until you pay it back, you'll pay three points. 
that's like 300 a week. And I said, Carmen, I robbed the bank because I'm broke. I mean, I, I don't know if I could pay you 300 a week. He, he goes into a tirade, he's fuming. Who the fuck are you? You were just facing seven and a half to 15 years for a bank robbery. I'm, I got the connection with McIntosh. I'm putting up the 10,000 and you can't pay me $300? Who the fuck do you, who are you? The money don't come down from me to you. It comes up from you to me. I, I said, come on, please, take it easy. I, 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 I'm, I made a mistake. You, you're a thousand percent right. I apologize. I didn't mean it in a way that I'm not going to pay. I, I meant it would be hard. But no, I'll, 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 the money will be here every week. I apologize. I learned a good lesson. I learned that the Mafia has tremendous connections. If it wasn't for them, I would have did seven and a half to 15 years in prison. He not only knew the guy through McIntosh, he put up the money, got me a lawyer, and I'm complaining about paying juice. I will never make that fucking mistake again for as long as I live in Gozen Austria or in any life. He deserved total respect. Not a stupid kid saying something about, I can't pay the money, I'm broke. What kind of bullshit is that? I learned a lesson about Rosen for a multitude of reasons. The power that they had, the connections that they had. And I was part of this. This is not a gang. This is not a club. This is a secret society and a brotherhood that don't play. You fuck up, they'll take your life. You do the right thing, you'll get respect. Love. Loyalty. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1968. So now that I started expanding with Shylock and making some monies and we were robbing and doing things, we wanted to open up a little business. So we knew this guy who was in the fruit and vegetable business and he loved horses, especially the horse Kelso. So we would call him, his name was Joe, Joe Kelso. So we grabbed him and we said, listen, Quit your job and we'll open up a little fruit and vegetable store. You'll be a partner with us and we'll open up this store. And that's what we did. We built the store up a little bit and we put the name of the store was Joe Kelso's Fruit and Vegetable Store. And he would work and come in and wait on the customers and he knew what there was to know about that kind of business. There was a back room we would go in the back room. It was almost like a little club to us. We would go in there and hang out and bullshit and play cards and plan things and do all kinds of bullshit. And uh, one day he opens up the door and he says, Sammy, look at this. This woman is robbing us. So I go by the door and I look out, out the door and there's an old lady in her 60s and she's taking some stuff, grapes or whatever she was stealing and putting it in a bag and she would sneak it out. So I was like, what do you want me to do? So he says, Sammy, we can't allow that. So I was, we were always joke and goof on each other, and I told him, listen, Joe, go over there in that desk over there, open up the drawer, there's a gun in the drawer. Go over there, shoot her in the fucking head, and then we'll get rid of the body. Now, he was a legitimate guy. He was scared to death. You want me to shoot her? I started laughing, I said, no. I said, but what the fuck you want me to do, bro? He says, I talked to her. 
I said, all right, I'll talk to her. I go out and I went over to her, Senora, you're robbing the stuff. It's our store, it's my store, you're robbing us. Okay, okay, but uh, we broke, I'm broke. Me too. I'm broke too. Listen to me, don't rob me. Take it, bring it to the Joe over there at the counter. Let him ring it up, put it in your bag, and tell him, put it on Sammy's tab. <laughs> so she does that. And whatever the tab was, I took a few dollars out, I threw it in the register, hey, she's paid. And whenever she comes here, I give her what she wants, put it on my tab, tell me what it is. And a couple of days, maybe a week later, I'm in the back again, he comes over, he says, Sammy, you ruined my life. How'd I ruin your life? What the fuck did I do now? He said, look, look outside. I look out the door again, and there's, the place is crowded. All kinds of old people buying shit. So I said, it looks good. She's probably talking good about us, and uh, look, we got a lot of customers. He said, but none of them are paying. They're bringing it to the counter, and they're telling me, put it on Sammy's tab. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not gonna pay for it. I said, listen, Joe, we're already setting up a little club that we're opening up. We're gonna go. I'm gonna leave here. You keep the whole business, it's yours. Keep it. I don't want nothing. It's yours, good luck. You're a great partner. I'm not, this isn't a good business for me. And uh, I'm not gonna keep paying for all this stuff. And then give it to them. Half the times you throw it away, it's getting rotten. So give it to them. No, no, I, all right, kid. Thank you, Sammy, but I'll, I'll work it out. Good. Listen, don't ever let somebody come and tell me that you're giving these old people a hard time. They're all broke, bro. Don't do that. And I left. Benzenhurst, Brooklyn, 1957. I went to another school. McKinley Junior High School was in another neighborhood. Not that many Italians, mostly Irish, Swedish, Polish people. It was a different neighborhood. I was a good looking kid. I got along with the women, but the men, the boys, every day I was in a fucking fight. A couple of times I would get jumped. And the rampers would not find out, you got jumped, bro? Yes. Where they stay? In the McKinley Park at night. We would steal a car, go fucking flying down the McKinley Park, jump out, and break their fucking asses. They learned that jumping me, they wanted to fight a fair fight, a fight. But jumping me, there was going to be retaliation for it. But I got thrown out of that school as well. Then I went to 600 school. It's a borderline of uh, a children's jail or something. It's not a children's jail, it's borderline. Next step is, is that. It's every fuck up in the, in the city goes to this school. To cover my not being able to spell or read, numbers didn't look alike, nothing looked right to me and it was very difficult. I would joke a little bit, like a class clown, to cover the, the hurt of not being able to do certain things, I guess. And one day in the schools, the guy, the teacher said something, I made a joke out of it, they were all laughing, there was a kid in front of me, stood up, long black coat, almost down to, past his knees, and he got up and he was hollering at me and he had a Bible in a, or something in his hand, looked like a Bible. And as he's talking to me, he started patting me on the head with a boom, boom, boom. By about the fourth tap, I cracked him. I knocked him out cold. And I got thrown out of the entire school system. So I was out. I was done with school. New York, 1970. In the rampers, it was one thing, you know, Robin, it was a gang. In the mafia, as even an associate, it was a whole nother ball game. 
So one of my first experiences dealing with the mafia at this level, me and my friends, we went and we did a burglary on a clothing store. There's no uh, alarm on the store. We got together and we hit this store. We took everything. Then we started selling stuff. Two days later, Shorty calls me and tells me, we have to go down to see Joe Colombo himself. He wants to talk to you. Joe Colombo wants to talk to me? Yeah. I go down with uh, Shorty and I meet with Joe Colombo. Joe Colombo tells me, from what I understand, you robbed the clothing store. And I said, yes, I did. He said, the guy who owns the store is a friend of mine. You got to give the stuff back. I'm a little stunned, but this guy's the boss of the family. I tell him, okay, uh, I sold a few things, but we'll get everything back. Even the stuff we sold, we'll go give the people the money back. Well, I'll get everything back. Nods his head, okay, get it done, Sammy. And uh, I went back to my friends and told them what happened. They're all sick about it, but it is what it is. This is not a game. This is not, you know, it's us against the world. This is the mafia at a very high level. We agree. We got to give it back. We give it back. We bring it to the store. The guy is there and who owns the store. And we bring everything back, car after car after car, loaded with stuff. Shirts, pants, suits, you name it, we're bringing it back. A couple of days, maybe a week later, I get called again. I grab my friends. Hey, bro, did we give every fucking thing back? I'm being sent for again. No, we got everything, Sammy. I mean, we got even some of the stuff we gave it away. We got the, we got the stuff back and we, we gave everything. All right. So I go there. Walk over and Joe Colombo is there again. He said, I appreciate what you did, Sammy. Everything was there. I appreciate it. I talked to my friend and I asked him a question. Do you have insurance? He said, yeah, I had insurance. And you reported the theft, right? Yeah, I did. So the insurance company is going to give you a check. Is that right? Yeah. And now I'm telling them I have to go buy the stuff, which I don't. I got it all back. So Joe Colombo tells his friend, these kids who robbed this store, they're broke. Good kids, street kids. So you're going to get an insurance check and you're getting all the clothes back. You're going to make a little score out of this. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll be way ahead of the game. Well, what I want is half of that check, which you get. And these kids are going to get that money. They put up their balls and they stole. When I asked them to bring it back, they brought it back. You told me they brought everything back. Yes, they did. Good. Cash that check and give me that money. And the guy's going to give me the money, he told me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you and your friends the money. I like the way you conduct yourself, Sammy. I appreciate it, Joe. And, and I'll put together a package for you. For No, no, no. Don't give me anything. Keep it amongst your friends. Keep doing what you're doing, Sammy. Be honorable. You didn't try to lie, and you did everything you were told to do. That's your gift to me, not the money. Everything I hear about you from Kamai Persico, from Shorty, 
I like. And I got my ear to the street, just like I knew you robbed the store. So go and enjoy yourself. This guy really, really won my heart at that time. To me, Joe Colombo was the man. I had tremendous respect for him for doing that. When I went back to my friends, they were stunned. So I said, we're, we're going to get half of that money. I, I think it's more than we would have got selling the stuff because we were selling the dirt cheap. We had a couple of drinks, laughing, talking. And uh, that was one of my first experiences with the mafia as being an associate. And to have someone like him, to have that kind of respect or show that kind of respect was amazing. It taught me a lot. One day early on, they're starting to use me a little bit more. I had this reputation from the rampers and everything, so they wanted to use me. I'm doing things. I'm in the street. Shorty tells me that Carmine wants to see me, Carmine Persico. I go down there, and he tells me about some guy who is uh, fucking around with somebody's wife. And he wants me to go there and uh, give this guy a tremendous beating. And he wants his ear. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1959. My family basically were hardworking people. My mother was a seamstress. My father was a painter, couldn't paint anymore. And they got a small little dress factory and they would make clothes for a Jewish contractor from Manhattan. I help occasionally. When they're gonna ship clothes out on a Monday, I go there on a Sunday night. When they make the dresses, they have threads hanging and stuff. So I clip the threads put plastic bags over them, get them ready for shipping on Monday. I mean, they worked six days a fucking week. Three or four nights a fucking week, they would go in and work nights. So I went in and helped on occasion. So one day I was there and I was in the back, clipping the threads and putting the plastic bags over the dresses that were gonna go out. And the door opens up and there's two guys come in. They end up being uh, two uh, union delegates, Irish guys, big guys. And I hear them getting loud with my father. I don't do much. They don't see me, but I sneak on the side a little bit and pay attention to what's going on. And I hear them telling my father, you're not union. You're breaking the rules. You have to be union. If you don't have an envelope for us, the next time we come in, we'll break your legs. We'll fuck up the whole place. We're coming back tomorrow to straighten this out and pick up an envelope. Otherwise, you got a problem. They're threatening him. My father doesn't look like he's nervous, doesn't look like he gives a shit one way or another. So I don't react, I just stay there quiet and I listen. That night, I went back with the rampers. Jerry Papa was the leader of the rampers. I told Jerry Papa what happened, what I overheard. The guys are coming back tomorrow. I'm gonna take a couple of the guys. They'll stay with me in the back. If they do anything to my father, we'll come out, we'll just bust them up. He opens up his jacket, and there's a gun. He says, Sammy, don't do that. Take this. Take it out of my waist. They hit your father. Shoot them in the fucking head. Call me up. Then we'll come down with a couple of guys, and we'll get rid of the bodies. I never killed anybody yet at my, uh, in my life. 
I never did something to that degree. I was nervous with it. But the thought of them coming in and beating my father up, I took the gun. That next day, I had that gun in my belt. That same area with the dresses and the bags where they didn't see me. I was thinking, my heart was beating a little faster. I was nervous. But I was gonna kill these two motherfuckers if the minute they raised their hands, I was gonna come out blazing. I heard the door opening up and I put my hand on the gun. I pulled the gun out. I took a couple of deep breaths, I was ready. They were gonna go. And I hear the strangest things. Mr. Gravano, why didn't you tell us? You don't have to, don't worry about the union. I can't believe my ears, I don't even know what the fuck I'm listening to. What happened when I break your legs? What happened that he don't have a fucking envelope? Why don't you tell us that you, uh, you know Suvido? Why don't you tell us? And I hear my father say, he's my gumbara. But why don't you tell us that? Here, they've given them a card, their card in the union. If anybody ever comes here and bothers you, asks you about the union, give, us, give them that, our card or call us up. Don't worry about nothing. And just before they leave, Please, Mr. Gravano, don't forget, tell Sophie that we were here now and what we said. And my father's not, okay. And they leave. I come out, the gun is back in my waist, my jacket's over it. I said, Dad, what, what was that? He says, they, they got big mouths. I went to my gumbada, Suvido, and told him what happened. And he probably talked to them. Suvido. Suvido, I knew he was my father's gumbada. I've seen him a couple of times. A little guy like my father, but Skitty is fucking, a good wind could blow him the fuck over. What the hell was he going to do against these two fucking monsters? How could they have that kind of fear for him? He's a lightweight. I find out later that Suvido is a made guy. Comes from Sicily, he's a made guy in Sicily in the United States. And he's got a reputation and a half. He's a shooter. That made me understand the power of the mafia. You could be that intimidated over this little skinny old man. Wow, I understood it. But I told my father that night, if they didn't do that, I had this done. I had this covered. What were you gonna do? I opened my jacket, I showed him the gun. My father never hit me in my life. He came close that night. We don't do that, I told you, we go to honest people. We don't do things like that. Give me that fucking gun, he took the gun. He was hot as a bastard. I eventually got the gun back from him. I told him it wasn't mine, and I had to give it back. I got the gun back, and I gave it to Papa. So that was like one of my first encounters. Well, I always knew those guys on the corner, what they were, bad guys, our bad guys, all that stuff. But this was mind-boggling to me. New York, 1968. We have the address of the place now and what he looked like and who he was and that you would go into this little store, there was a big counter. You go to the counter and you talk to him about buying washing machines and dryers. So I wanted Tommy to do all the talking and I said, you do the talking, tell him we're opening up a place and uh, 
when he hands you a pamphlet and stuff, pull it towards you so that he leans forward and you point to something so he has to lean forward to be able to see what you're talking about. I had a blackjack and I'll whack him in the fucking head. So we went, it was out in Long Island and uh, we went there and uh, as planned, we went in and, you know, walked around the store a little bit. And then when he came out, we went to him and Tommy started talking to him and telling him we're opening up this place and we'd like to see some stuff. Do you have pamphlets? Could I see it? You know, you, so you could explain to me. And the guy took out a pla pamphlet, looked like a big menu type of thing. And uh, he's explaining his stuff and Tommy did what he was supposed to. He pulled the thing close to him and pointed to something. The guy leaned forward and I cracked him a good shot right on the side of the head with the blackjack. He was a big guy. He went down, screaming, yelling. I jumped on top of the counter and I was gonna go over and see if I could get his ear. He was grabbing onto the counter his fingers were on the tip of the counter and he was trying to pull himself up. So to stop him from doing that, I whacked his hand with the blackjack so hard that one of his fingers went flying. I knocked his, actually knocked his finger off. By the time I jumped over, I took a peek to see where the finger was. And these guys in the factory were running towards the front. There was a bunch of them, four or five of them. It was just a regular doorway to come out. And it seemed like they were all crowded there. The one guy who was coming through the opening, I smashed him in the face with the blackjack. He started screaming. They probably didn't know if he got shot or hit. Or they didn't, whatever it was, the guy was bleeding like a sieve and they backed up just a little bit, enough for me to jump back onto the counter. And we ran out of the store and took off. I didn't have the ear and I didn't have the finger. So I said, did you see what happened? To Tommy Spiro. The finger? Yeah. Yeah, fucking thing went flying in the air probably caught the corner of the, the, the desk. I didn't actually mean to do that, but it happened. I said, you think I'm in trouble now? Well, what? I don't have the ear, I don't have the finger. I mean, I got orders to take the fucking ear. I think I could have got away with it if I took the finger, but I couldn't get it. I didn't know where it was, where it landed, and the guys were coming out. And I, so I saw them, I saw them. Well, we went back to Brooklyn and uh, he called up his uncle, Shorty, and uh, he explained the whole thing, what happened. I talked a little bit. We stayed there a while and he says, okay, let's go down, downtown. Come on, Pusco, stay down around Carroll Street, downtown Brooklyn. So we drove down there. We got there, Shorty walked in first, called Carmine, and Carmine came out with Shorty. I was standing outside, and uh, he came over. And I didn't know what to expect. And he laughed a little bit. What happened? I said, the story, just like I just told you, I told him what happened. And I said, I couldn't get the ear. The, the guys in the back were coming out. I mean, I would have had, had to fight four or five guys. I hit one of them in the face and I said, his finger came off. I jumped over the counter. I, want, I tried to grab the finger, but I couldn't, I didn't see it. I couldn't get it. He started laughing. He says, I already know exactly what you did. I got somebody in that plant. And I know the whole story. The guy's in the hospital. They're going to put his finger back on or do something with the finger. 
And he was laughing. You did a great job, Sammy. I took a deep breath. It was like, he was happy. I was happy. I didn't have to cut his ear off. I didn't have to grab the finger. So we were all happy. Got back in the car and left. It was things like this that made Carmine look at me differently. My first piece of work, my first murder was with them. He knew I did it. Now this, and a bunch of other things. Every time I had a beef, I came out pretty strong with the beef, and he was happy with me. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1957. They bought a, a bike for me, a Schwinn. It was a classy bike. It was expensive. And my father, the first thing he told me, he says, take care of the bike. We don't have a lot of money. I can't buy you another one. Take care of it and stuff like that. One day I went to the corner grocery store. I left my bike outside. When I came out, it was gone. Somebody robbed it. It broke my heart, and I didn't even want to tell my mother and father that I lost the bike. My friends one day, a couple of days later, whatever it was, yelled to me, Sammy, down the block near the fruit and vegetable store, there's a couple of kids, there's your bike over there. I hurried, ran down the block, and there it was. I grabbed the hole of the bike, two kids, both of them older than me, had the bike, and they wanted to keep it. End result, I held on to the bike and started fighting with both of these kids. They were older. When you're that young, a year or two makes a big difference. And uh, I was fighting my ass off. I was getting beat up a little bit, but I was fighting for it. Across the street from that fruit and vegetable store were those guys who were dressed and playing crap in the street and talking to police cars, street guys, mafia guys. I don't know which one was made or which one wasn't, but they were mob guys. One of them came across and grabbed me and the bike and what's going on? He seemed to know who my mother and father was and sisters were. So I said, this is my bike. They stole it. I'm taking it back and, all right, all right, calm down. He questioned the kids a little bit. They seemed to get a little shy. They know they stole the bike. They said, well, we got it. It's ours. And the guy told the kids, go get your fucking father. If it's your bike, go get your father and bring him over here. They got a little scared. He chased them. They ran away. One of the other guys across the street yelled to him, What's going on over there? He said, listen, this is uh, Katie and Jerry's son, Sammy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's my name. He said, look at him. He fought these kids off to get his bike back. He's like a little fucking bull. That name stuck like glue. All my friends was calling me Sammy the Bull. Later on in life, when cops were looking for me, they would come around and ask for Sammy the Bull. That name stuck. I hated it at first, but I've had that nickname all my life. New York, 1971. Well, we had this crew under Shorty and this guy, Ralphie Ronger, uh, was around us. And uh, he got killed. One night I was in Shipset Bay in a bar, dingy little bar. Most people don't, don't go there. It's not crowded at all. So I'm there with this guy, Johnny Rizzo, was a made guy in the Gambino family. I was friendly with him for a long time. We did a lot of robberies. We did a lot of things with him. And so I knew him real good. Louis Melito was there. Mike Gumbada Ali Boy was there. This guy, Mikey Mozzarella, was there. There was a few other guys there. A guy, a pretty big guy, comes in with a woman. 
and they go stand on the bar to the other end. Like I said, it's dark, it's dingy. Rizzo pats me on the shoulder and says, I think that woman's looking at you. And I tell him, come on, John. Because we break each other's balls and, uh, you know, she's not looking at me and we're going to say something. The guy's going to say something. Here we go again. Another fight. Come on. Stop breaking balls. Nothing said. We just keep going on with it. Sure enough, Louis Molito tells me, I don't think he's fucking around, Sam. This girl can't take her eyes off you. Oh, you're going to start too? No, she's looking at you. Do you know her? I can't barely see her. And I'm looking. No, I don't know her. I don't know this woman. And she's, what a guy. Let her look. What's, what's the big deal? The guy gets up and he's going to the bathroom. We're not paying attention again. She gets up and she starts walking towards us. And Rizzo says, look, she's still looking at She's coming over. Go see who she is. Go say hello or whatever. So I start walking towards her. When I get close to her, I look at her. She's got blonde hair, all blown up, short mini skirt. They weren't that mini back then. This is... Back then, it was real short, high heels. And I look at her, and I can't fucking believe it. It's Ralphie Ranga's wife. He's just dead a a week or two. And I look at her, and I said, what are you doing here? And who's that guy? She said, Sammy, life goes on. Life goes on, yeah. He's not even cold yet. You can't wait a while? She said, Sammy, I, I could get rid of him. I know the way you used to look at me. Me? Looking at you? Get, get the fuck away from me. As I'm really ripping into her, I am, I'm so fucking mad this guy starts coming out of the bathroom. My friends see him coming over. He's a pretty big guy. They all get up. They're ready. That's us. We're ready. When something's going to happen, you're in trouble with all of us. But they get ready. The guy comes over. He looks a little, he's a little nervous. What's the matter? No, nothing's the matter. Get this fucking cunt. Get her out of here. While you can, get the fuck out. He grabs her, she, they get up, they leave. The next day, I come home, and my wife is hysterical, crying. What happened? She said, Ralph Spiro called me up. You try to make Ralphie wrong his wife? the fuck out of here. I didn't do that. Who told you that? Ralph. He said, Junior's gonna kill you for what you did. Call my person. He told you that on the phone. Yeah. Stop crying. This is a very technical life that I'm living. Tell me exactly what the fuck he said. My wife don't lie for shit. She said it exactly the same way. Okay, relax, relax. I go in the bedroom, I go in the drawer, I get my gun, put it in my pants, go in my car, and I'm on my way to Ralph's house. This is Shorty Spiro's brother. When I get to the house, I go to the house. Usually, I would walk into the house. It's like, that's how we were, like good fellas. I would just walk in. But I rang the bell. I had the gun out and behind my back slightly, right by my ass. So as soon as he came to the door, I was going to shoot him. But he didn't come to the door. His wife, Ann, came to the door. 
Hey, Sammy, what's up? Nothing. Uh, listen, something came up. I got to talk to Ralph. It's very important. Do me a favor. Just tell him to come to the door. No, he's not here. Did something happen? Because uh, he left a, a couple hours ago like something's wrong. No, 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 Ann, there's nothing wrong. And I just tell him I was here. And I turn around, not a full turn, a half a turn to walk away, and she sees the gun. A quick glance of it. But she obviously tells them that I came to the house looking for Ralph with a gun. The next thing I get is Johnny Rizzo comes to talk to me. He says, you're set up for an appointment. There's a whole story that came out about this that's not true. You're going to get hurt. There's a bunch of guys there. You're going to get the beating of your fucking life. They're really going to bust you up bad. You went with a gun to Ralph's house, bro? Yeah. They're going to break every bone in your body. Don't go there. What do you want me to do? Go on a fucking lamp? I got to go there. They're my people. Where would, I, where would I go? I always thought I would die early in life or go to prison. It was a reality for me. I've seen it in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, over and over and over again. And I, I just took it as part of the life. If I fuck up, I'll go. Maybe I'll go with somebody's girlfriend or something and go. There's so many ways to go. I stopped worrying about it. I just lived my life. I tried to be honorable, not to lie, not to cheat, not to double cross people and do the right thing. Now, when they told me to go in the street or go on a murder, I did it. I wasn't worried or concerned. It's part of the life. I had to do it. Going into that meeting, knowing I was going to get hurt, it was part of the life. I understood it. I said to myself, I hope I just live through this fucking thing. And if I'm really, really maimed, I hope I die. Next thing I go and get a, a notice that tomorrow I have to go and pick up this guy, Tato Arello. I knew this kid, Charlie Boy, he was a friend of mine. This was his father. I knew his father was a heavyweight gangster in the Gamino family. I wasn't made, I was an associate. So I, he, I know he was a captain and a heavyweight. I'm gonna pick him up and I'm gonna drive with him to Carroll Street, where the purse goes off. Johnny Rizzo went to Tato. Tato must have went to Carlo Gambino. And there was conversations on a high level. Carmine Persico was in prison. His brother was the consigliere of the family. And he was the acting boss while his brother was gone. And he was going to be there. I go down there. Very little conversation between me and Tato. I don't even know what to say to him. We get out, we walk over, we get near the bar. Guys must have told them that we were there. They come out of Persico Senior. Shakes Tato's hand and shakes my hand. And he starts talking and tells me, there's been some high level conversations about this. I gotta ask you a few things, Sammy. Did you go there with a gun? Yes. Were you gonna shoot him? Yes. He told your wife that my brother was gonna kill you? 
Yes. You did the right fucking thing. If he wasn't Shorty's brother, we would kill him. Just for that. He said, but he is Shorty's brother. You did things for us already. We know what you're capable of, meaning a piece of work I did with them. He said, the decision from the top is this. You're going to be transferred from the Colombo family to the Gambino family. You're going to be with him, he points to Tato. He's a good man. You're going to be with him, and you're going to be with them. You're always our friend. That doesn't stop. I need one thing from you. I need you to tell me that you will not hurt Ralph Spiro. I give you my word. It's over. Good. Gives me another hug, kiss, and we leave. I get in the car with Tato, and we're coming back, and he's talking to me now. He says, the old man Johnny Rizzo came to me, and I went forward. There's a lot of people involved in this. I don't know you. I know you know my son. But I'm going to know every fucking thing about you. I'm going to know you better than you know yourself. I got a club on Bath Avenue. I know the club. You're going to be there every fucking day. You working? Quit. You come to that club every fucking day when I'm there, and we're going to talk. You embarrass us in any way, shape, or form after we did all of this, we'll kill you immediately. No questions asked. Nobody can intervene. Whatever you do, you want to go on a robbery. Anything you want to do, you have to ask me first. You want to get laid, you better tell me first. Before you do any fucking thing, do you understand the position you're in? Yes. Tato Arello. Well, Tato in the family was a heavyweight. Now, there's a boss, an underboss, and a consigliere. That's the administration. Under them, there's captains. Tato was a captain, no different than any other captain. The difference is how well respected he was and liked. That excelled him more than the other captains. He, he was known he'd always give you a fair shake. He'd always be honest with you. Other captains may be more devious. You, some people think the devious captains would excel more than him, but that don't happen. So what made him more respected was his ability to be honest, tell the truth, help you out if he could. He would do things from his heart, not from just being a gangster. I learned so much from this old man. It was incredible. He was the same height as my father, the same built as my father. They both come from Italy. They both had the same everything. And I got to love this guy like I love my father. I learned Goza Nostra in a whole different light. In the Colombo family, beat this guy all up, take his ear off, go hijack a truck, shoot this guy, we're at war. That's all it was. This place was business, unions, scams. They could kill you and would, but that wasn't their cup of tea every day when they wake up. It was a different goes in Austria. Benzenhurst, Brooklyn, 1964. When I was 19 years old, I got drafted into the military, the army. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. That's where I went for basic training. 
was an infantry unit. It was uh, during the Vietnam War. At first, I started working uh, on the chow line, KP, kitchen duty. And uh, I would serve on the line. I made friends with a guy from the Bronx. All of us guys from New York and New Jersey and the Bronx kind of stood together. Nobody knew anybody. So we were standing on line serving. There's this big metal table with big trays in front of you. I had a long metal spoon. I would dig into whatever it was and put it in the guy's tray. The trays were metal. I knew about racist stuff back then, but not like this. It was a little bit more, and it became very obvious. So there was a couple of guys, big guys, hillbillies on the line. And uh, the guy came in front of the black guy who was right in front of me, and he was serving him something, and he was calling him boy. Get this, boy. Do this, boy. Those remarks I thought was going to be something that would get this black guy going. I looked at him. He didn't really pay too much attention to him. He put the stuff on his tray. Then the guy moved over to me, and I was serving beans or something like that. And he put his tray out in front, and he said, whoop it on me, boy. So now he's calling me boy. So I put the beans in the tray, one scoop, two scoops. By the third scoop, it was starting to drip over on the sides of the compartment. And I stopped. He took the whole tray, turned it sideways and threw it, all the food, everything on the counter. And said, when I tell you whip it on me, boy, I want you to whip it on me. I'll tell you when to stop. I looked at him. I didn't even know what to say. I got the metal spoon, and I just whacked him as hard as I could right in the forehead. He went flying backwards. I didn't realize that the guy behind him was his friend, and another one behind him was another friend. The guy behind him hit me with his metal tray right in the side of the face. Hit me a good shot, knocked me backwards. The black guy jumped over the counter and started throwing punches at the guy who hit me with the tray. By that time, I recovered from that little shot and I jumped over the counter and we were battling left and right. We were battling the whole three of them. It looked like the whole place bursted into a fight. It was crazy. Before long, the MPs, the military police, came in. One of the guys in charge of the military police was a sergeant and uh, a big black guy, heavyweight type of guy. And me and this black kid from the Bronx, we're sitting on the floor, food all over us, just got done battling. And the sergeant looked at me and he said, you like jumping in, helping about black people, boy? Now I knew he got this thing wrong. He must have thought that I jumped in to help the black guy. It really wasn't that way, it was the other way around. I'm the guy who got hit, he jumped in to help me. But I'm not stupid. I figured let him think that, that's good for me. I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I'm from New York and that's what we do, you know. He gave me a little wink. That wink told me I knew I wasn't in trouble. And I was real happy about what I said and did. He grabbed me and the black guy and he said, from here on out, you're never going to serve on the line anymore. When you guys come in for KP duty, you're going to be sitting in the back peeling potatoes until they come out of your ears. Okay, this is what we got to do. That's the punishment. That's the end of it. 
I'd rather peel those potatoes than stand on that line anyway. So that's what we did. So we go out the first time together again, and we're sitting on the back patio, peeling potatoes, buckets of water, big, big, I don't know what size they were, but they're big, huge pots filled with water and potatoes, and we're peeling them. So the black guy tells me, he says, hey, Sammy, you knew how to play that pretty good, <laughs> that you jumped in to help me. I said, bro, I'm not stupid. I might as well. He was a black guy. He, he, he liked hearing that. So, yeah, I played it. And he laughed. He said, I would have did it the other way around. <laughs> I says, if I was you. So we, we got along. We got along real good. We did our basic training. People screaming, yelling. When you get up in the morning, running, jogging. The military didn't bother me too much. When I went in, I was 19 years old. I was in excellent condition. I didn't have an ounce of body fat on me. The, the marching didn't bother me, the jogging, the, the push-ups, sit-ups, all of that stuff was relatively easy for me. I enjoyed learning how to shoot a rifle and the aim and doing different things, and playing war games and stuff like that, preparing us for Vietnam, teaching us how to kill. Tato Arello. In the meetings that I went down and sat with him every day, I mean, I, I was completely blown away by this guy. I mean, he was really, really street smart. He had a lot of wisdom. And uh, I was learning from him every day of the week. He would smooth with me on occasion. He got to like me a little. And he would talk about his past growing up. When he was talking to me, he was talking to me about Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, Al Capone. Those were his friends growing up. Those stories, I mean, they were like legends. I couldn't believe my ears on this stuff. And so one day he got, you know, very tight with me and he said, come in my backyard in the club. Now his backyard had fig trees, an orange tree, tomato plants. It almost looked like that picture in The Godfather. He would sit with his pants rolled up a little bit, his nice shoes and galoshes and with the hose, a little cigar hanging out of his mouth. And he would talk to me. I would sit next to him and he would talk to me. He said, today I got somebody coming to talk to me. I want you to sit there. Don't get up and leave. Stay there. Don't say one word. Okay. This guy comes in and says hello to Tato. He said, this is Sammy. Say hello to him. You could talk in front of Sammy. Don't worry about it. Talk. And the guy explains a story about his friend and something with the wife a compliment that he gave the wife, something like that. I, I guess he was making a play for the wife and whatever. He was making suggestions to the wife or whatever he was doing. So Tato hears the whole story and he says, all right, don't do anything. I'm going to talk to him and then I'll get back to you. Don't do anything. And the guy leaves. He said, if you were sitting in my chair, what would you do? I says, probably I would get a couple of young thugs like me and go beat up the other guy. I was used to that, the Colombo family. He said, good, good. I know what you did already with them. I know you got balls. And now I know you're stupid. 
that crushed me. It's like, I loved them. I couldn't even understand. I said, why? Why am I stupid? He said, come here tomorrow. Same time, sit in the back with me. The other guy's going to come in. The next day, I'm there early. I want, I want to be in there. I want to listen to this whole thing now. Same thing happens. We go in the backyard. This other guy comes in. And he tells his side of the story. She's a beautiful woman. She's a good woman. I gave her compliments. I, I, didn't, I wasn't coming on to her. I just meant, you know, that we were tight. And I complimented her. And he's taking it the wrong way and all this stuff. Tato says, OK. Go away. Don't talk to him. Don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. I'll get back to you. The guy gets up and leaves. He looks at me and he says, what would you do now? I said, I don't know. One of them is lying or uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't even know which one to believe. He said, it's not a matter of believing. I got a feeling one day you're going to sit in my chair. And you're going to make decisions. God gave you two ears so you can listen to both sides of the story. Don't rush to judgment and violence right away. We, we could always use violence. On the tail end, when we're sure we know what we're doing. Tomorrow, I'm going to have both of them here. Be here again tomorrow. Again, I was there early. The both of them came in. They both talked. It really was a misunderstanding, totally. And it was obvious. They hugged each other. They shook hands. And they left friends. He looked at me, he said, you would have hurt that guy for nothing. This is what you do when you sit in this chair. Violence is our last resort. Make sure you know what you're doing when you use violence. I use that lesson all through life about listening to both sides. You could sound so sincere, so honest. I want to hear the other side. Now, I may believe you because of the person you are and I know who you are, but when I don't know, I have to listen to both sides and make a judgment call. I never imagined sitting in his chair. I never imagined becoming what he was. And there were so many of these incidents with him. One day I told him, Taro, he was uneducated like I was. You seem to be right all the time. You make judgment calls. I, I don't understand. How do you know this stuff? It's like, he says, it's called wisdom. Patience and common sense. With Tato, it was one thing after the other, like that. There's another time he sits down and he tells me, you know there's a church on Bath Avenue down a couple of blocks. Black people go there. There was a minister or a preacher that he ran the church. The young kids in the neighborhood would go, I guess, break balls. So he tells me, go there and grab those kids and tell them to leave those people alone. Why would I do that? Because they're good people. They don't bother nobody. And they do numbers and turn into me and they do things. They're, they're good people. Go do it. 
Of course. So I go down there, I try it down there, I talk to the preacher, and uh, I grab these kids. If you go there and keep fucking with these people, I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna break your fucking ass. Don't do it. Preacher gets in touch with me, asks me to come down, thanks me, and he tells me to come to a sermon with them. I go in there, I'm the only white guy in there. And after the sermon, he comes over, thanks me for coming down, thanks me for what I did, and uh, tells me about a team. All these black kids growing up, a football team. They got no uniform. But I like to make a contribution to help buy them jersey and the football equipment. I said, yeah, of course. How much is it? No, you, you whatever you want to give. Well, how much is the whole thing? To buy all of them? Yeah. I don't remember the number. It wasn't like a real astronomical number. I mean, but it was a pretty decent number. And I went, came back, and gave him the whole number. Now, a couple of days later, I'm on the corner with my friends. Car pulls up, three, four big black guys get out. They walk over. Are you Sammy? Yeah. Why? What you did is so good, so kind. And this big guy tells me, if you got a problem with anybody, give us a holler. <laughs> I say, okay. Someday maybe I, I will. Are you going to come to Mass? We heard you were at Mass. Well, I don't think I'm going to be a regular, but if you want to invite me to a, a Mass or you want to invite me to a game, it'd be my pleasure. And we left. So Tato had me thinking differently. And what it reminded me of is my mother and father, who were really, really good, hardworking people. And I've learned so many good things. I'm being taught stuff by a heavyweight mafia dude who is almost like talking like my mother and father would talk. So I'm learning mafia in a whole different way, with respect, with loyalty. Different things were coming out of his mouth than came out of Carmine Persico's mouth or Shorty's mouth or my mouth back then. And um, I was learning two different things, two different ways. So Tato was really, really a beautiful guy in every way. He used the power he had to help so many people that I have saw. It was crazy. Everybody in the neighborhood would go to him, especially on Bath Avenue and his confined area, loved him. March 24th, 1972. I was an associate, I believe, in the Mafia, and I went to see a movie, The Godfather. I was completely stunned how true to life this thing was. Not only about the mafia, but the Italian people themselves, the wedding, the families, the kids, the grandmothers, the grandfathers, how family-oriented this whole thing was. That's just exactly the way we lived. There was a lot of things I didn't know about the mafia that that movie showed me. It was based on a true story, it wasn't a true story. I understood that. This goes back to when I was in the Colombo family. I saw uh, James Kahn, 
come down and talk to Carmine Persico and ask for permission to be in the movie. Carmine Persico's cousin, Andrew Russo, was connected with all kinds of people in Hollywood. And I would think he was playing this James Caan. He brought him in to ask permission and all looked good, sounded good, it sounded like a mafia movie. Later on, James Caan became Andrew Russo's the godfather to one of his kids. Whether he was the godfather or Andrew was the godfather, they became Goombatas. Well, that movie changed a lot of things. In the neighborhood, we were well known like that. But overall, to the entire country, you weren't known like that. And it took on a whole nother level, the way people looked at you. Even in the neighborhood, I guess there's some people who may have heard about it, but don't know it, didn't understand it. When they saw that movie, they had a, a different view, a different image of the mafia. And uh, I think the image got better, to tell you the truth. But it became more national, more widely known than it was. There was a lot of conversation between associates, even made men, about the movie. I don't know of anybody who didn't like it because it was about the mafia. I mean, I think they all liked it. The movie showed you a little more structure, a little more insight of structure, what a boss was, an underboss, a concierge. It showed you captains. It showed you structure. And it showed some of the rules. When they're taught, told to kill, boom, they kill. So between Godfather 1 and Godfather 2, I mean, if you look at it, they were pretty brutal movies. But it brought it home the reality of the mafia and why that brutality took place. They didn't just get up in the morning and want to kill people. They killed people for Cosa Nostra, to protect it, for people who broke the rules. I had a tough rep reputation in the Rampus and coming up as a kid. My reputation, I think, went through the roof in the Colombo family. Not only did I do my first piece of work there, I was called upon, I told you one or two stories, I've been called upon many, many times. And uh, people knew that. I was talking with Shorty, with Carmine Persico, people see that. On occasion, I spoke with Joe Colombo. I was in the second part of the Profaci Gallo War. And I lived with them, I hit the mattresses with them. People saw this. When I was with Tato, now I'm around Tato like he wanted me to every day. I was there every day like glue. And my reputation was going through the roof. But I had his reputation of being good and honest and all these good things about him started to rub off on me as well. He was excelled because of his good reputation. Not because of the bad things he did, but the good things. And mine was doing the same exact thing. Sammy will give you a fair shake. He'll take your fucking head off. But he's gonna give you a fair shake. He's not looking to rob you, he's not looking to hurt you. He's not looking to do anything like that. In business, I took shots in business that didn't work out. And um, I always walked away good from things. I learned from when I failed. You know, I, my reputation was flying at that time. New York, 1975. In 1975, the books were open after 20 years to start making people again. 
the commission sat down, all the bosses, and determined to have this happen. In 75, when it opened, they made 10 guys per family, each family, the whole five families. I didn't even know that happened. I found out later, because my friend Frank Chico was in the first batch of guys who got made. He was one of those 10. I was real happy for him. But I was now with the Gambino family, and I was still doing my thing. And one night I went to a, a club, um, an entertainment club. And uh, a guy named Sally Ebenezer, very powerful captain in the Colombo family, came over to me by the bar, put his arm around me. How you doing, buddy? How's things now that you're over there with the Gambinos? I said, Go, going real good. Little Tato, I love him, bro. And uh, he says, yeah, he says, let me ask you a question, Sammy. Were you really going to shoot Ralph? I said, yes, I was. He started laughing. He hugged me. He said, I love you. He's such a fucking crazy fuck. I love you, bro. Good luck. And by the way, he passed your name around. I had no clue what that meant. At that time, nobody knew that you had to pass your name around. It goes to all the families. Anybody who has a complaint about you, something reasonable that you shouldn't get made, it's their time to open their mouth. I didn't know it at the time when he was telling me that. And then he said, Tato calls you uh, and tells you to wear a suit, white shirt, tie. It's going to be the best day of your life, bro. Don't worry about it, just go. I kind of like try to get something out of it. What do you mean? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see, pal. Rub my head a little bit, walked away. Sure enough, about a week or so later, Tato told me, Sammy, we got an appointment. I want you to wear a suit, white shirt, tie. And uh, you and my son are going to come with me to this appointment. Tato told me, Sammy, we got an appointment. I want you to wear a suit, white shirt, tie. And uh, you and my son are going to come with me to this appointment. We did it. I met uh, him and Charlie Boy, Tato's son, at the club. And uh, I was dressed up. We got in the car. I knew the house belonged to this guy. It was a made guy, Frank the Wop. And we went in. A guy came up from the basement and got one of the guys and said, come with me, and he brought him down the basement. Stayed there a while, he didn't come out. One after the other after the other. Matter of fact, I joked with Charlie. I said, listen, bro, this is starting to get scary. Six guys went down, they never came back. So Charlie obviously must have known from his father what was going on. He left, don't worry about it. I laughed too. I said, I'm not worried about it. I had an idea of what was happening. I didn't know the procedure or what happens, but I had an idea. Charlie went down. I was the last guy who went down. The guy who came up and grabbed me, hey, Sammy, how you doing? Good, good. He said, I'm going to take you downstairs, he says. Paul Castellano will be standing. You know who he is, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course I know who he is. He said, there's a chair next to him. You're going to sit down. Don't be nervous. Same thing. This may be the best day of your life. I was excited. I went down the stairs, old house, wooden stairs. The stairs were creaking. As I got down to the bottom, you could see the smoke coming out. It was a smoke-filled room. They must have had it pool table and some plywood on top because there was the other guys, the other nine guys sitting there, each of them sitting next to a captain. They were already made. I didn't know exactly that yet, but I walked over. I sat down. Paul Castellano says, don't be nervous. I want you to relax. He said, do you know everybody in this room? I said, no, not everyone. I know some of them. I don't know them all. Do you like the guys who you see? Yes, I do. 
He said, do you know what this is? I got an idea. This is a secret society and a brotherhood. Just stand next to me. I stood next to him. He told everybody to stand up. Everybody stood up. He said some words in Italian. Everybody locked hands in a, in a huge circle. I went to grab his hand and the next guy's hand next to me. He said, no, not you. Just sit, just sit down. I sat down. He said a bunch of stuff in Italian. And the last part of it, he said, in honor of our brotherhood, I closed the circle. And he shook the circle's hands. Everybody went up and down a little bit. Then they all sat down. He turned around to me and said, get back up. I got back up. He said, would you want to join this secret society, this brotherhood? Yes, was my answer. It would be my honor to belong to this. Most of these people are idols to me. Being a member of them on this level was unimaginable to me growing up. He talked about a lot of things about our society. And then he said, in our family, our code is this comes first in your life. It's above God and country, your personal family. It's above your own personal life. You protect this and keep it secret for your entire life. Tato Arello was the guy who proposed me to become a made member. So he was my godfather. Paul explained that he is the representant, meaning the boss of the family. He now is going to be my father. He explained about an underboss. He explained about the role of a consigliere. And then there's captains. Each captain has a crew of made men and associates. He broke it down. He broke down things about what would be a death penalty. If you raise your hands to another friend, meaning a made guy, it's the death penalty. If you went with another made guy's wife, knowingly, you would die for that. Respect and honor was at the highest level. He asked me if I understood. I said, yes, I do. Then he asked me, he said, if you were asked to kill for the family, would you kill on our orders without question, without remorse? Yes. What finger would you pull the trigger? I pointed to my index finger. He took out a, a saint from his pocket. He says, I'm going to burn this saint in your hands. There's an ashtray. When I tell you, you crush it and put the ashes in the ashtray. Tato came over, and he was the one who was going to prick my finger to make it bleed and to rub my blood on that saint. He lit it on fire and put it in my hand. He said, juggle it back and forth. I did, so that you don't burn your hands. I did that, I burnt my hands anyway. But I didn't feel any pain. One of the things he said, if you betray this oath in any way, shape, and form, may your soul burn in hell like this saint 
is burning in your hands. Crush it. He moved the ashtray. I crushed it in my hands, and the ashes went into the ashtray. Tato said, kiss the boss on both cheeks. I did. He told me to kiss Tato on both cheeks. I did. Tato said, go around the entire table and kiss each person, starting with all the underboss, the Kunzelaya, and just go around the table. I did that. He explained to me that there was five families in New York that were basically the commission. There was other families in other states and obviously in other countries. He locked in that circle again, but this time he made me lock in on either side with him and with Tato and everybody else locked in. And he turned to me and says, as of this moment, you are now a friend of ours, a made member in our family. Anything that happened to you in the past, anybody you don't like, it's dead. We never want to hear it again. You're born as of today. Don't bring grudges into this new life. We won't do anything for any grudge or anything you have for the past. You're born as of today. I understood that I nodded my head. We unlocked the circle, lighting up cigars and drinks and whatever. We celebrated for a while. Then we left the house in different groups like we came. Paul Castellano and the administration left first. Then each captain left with the guys who he brought there to become a friend of ours. I got into the car with Charlie and Tato and we went back to Tato's club. Waiting by the club was Boozy, Frankie De Chico, other guys who were made members and other guys who were associates who had a clue what was happening, but there would be no conversation about it with them. He introduced me to Frankie De Chico's Father Boozy, as a friend of ours. Tato explained to me that the only way to recognize a friend of ours, even if you know he was made, is a friend of ours who knows both of you and introduces you together. If you ever introduce someone as a friend, and you didn't know it for sure, you were never introduced to him or you made a mistake, it's the death penalty. Make sure with that. If you don't remember, then get introduced to the guy again, to somebody, the third party. Then I met Frankie De Chico and other guys. My friend Louis Melito was around, and some guys who were in Tato's crew who weren't made members, they quickly passed me by under their breath. Good luck, Sammy. We love it. Smiled and just quickly moved away. They knew the rules. I couldn't respond, no, like, as if I knew I was a made member to somebody who wasn't. I could never tell somebody who wasn't that I was a made member. I couldn't go celebrate, hey, I'm a made member today. That don't happen. It's a secret society. I still feel that everything I went through in my life, that might be one of the greatest days of my life. Getting married, having children, they were great days, but so was this. It ranked right up with that. The same way I love my father, I love Tato, and I donated everything I had, every drop of loyalty, 
that I could give, I gave throughout my whole existence in the Mafia. My emotions, it was surreal. It, I, I felt I was walking on clouds. The possibility of this, I never ever imagined being one of the people that I idolized, that I respected. I didn't have any family members to push me in. I didn't have anybody. My sisters weren't going out with any kind of street guys. I, I didn't even, I mean, I knew people myself, but a lot easier to get in when your father is in or your brother or your uncle or something or somebody. So to me, getting in was crazy. It was just, I was floored. Everything is changing in my life. The respect that I'm getting, everything. I never used that position back then. I was always a tough guy. I was always ready to shoot you or fight with you or do whatever. It didn't take that position to make me tougher, stronger. I knew that position he had already taught me to use wisdom, use patience, listen with your both ears to the story. Don't make harsh decisions. Don't use violence unless it's at the last resort. So I guess I was handling myself pretty good. My reputation just was exploding. Not only within our crew, within the family, but around Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, Manhattan. It was blowing up all over the place of who I was. And it, not because I was made, but because of things that happened and how I conducted myself when those things happened. I had a tough, tough fucking crew, good guys, tough guys. Most of them were associates. Eventually I was making some of them. But um, that added to my reputation as well. I stayed non-flashy, stayed in the neighborhood, went to the same restaurants, try to conduct myself like I always did. Don't overdress, don't start putting diamonds all over the place. This is a secret society. I live by that. That word meant something to me. Frankie DeChico. Frankie DeChico, I grew up with him. I think he was about 12 or 14 years older than me. And he, he became like a big brother to me. We came out of the same exact neighborhood. We knew each other. He was very, very powerful, very, very ballsy, tough guy, but very fucking fair, very, very honorable. And he was for the underdog. If there was a problem, he always seemed to take the underdog's side. Like if a guy had a problem with three or four made guys or associates, he'd always take the other guy's problem and take his back to say, come on, bro, we did that same shit when we were young, leave him alone. Let's, let's just yell at him and chase him out. He was that type of guy who's always for the underdog. His whole family was in the mob uncles, cousins, you name it, the, the, the Chicos were like a mob within itself. The women were like gangsters. I think you could have killed somebody right in front of the women. They'll help you drag the body out. They'll never cooperate against you. They'll never do anything. So the whole family, the, the Chico family, had that aura about them. Frankie is not known to the public that much. I was a tough guy with a real tough crew. John Gotti was a tough guy with a tough crew. If you put my crew and John Gotti's crew together, we weren't a pimple on Frankie DeChico's ass. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Anytime he opened up a club or got a piece of a bar or a business, I always went to spend money there and uh, anything to build him and help him, I, I was there and I did it. He had a crap game in this club. 
in the back room. There was a crap table, shooting dice. The front, there was a bar. And uh, I was at the bar with his father, who was also a made guy, and he was also with Tato. And we were drinking at the bar and talking, and a door opened up, and John Gotti came in, very flashy, with a bunch of guys, a little entourage, four or five guys. I heard a lot of things about him. I didn't know him personally. I had a friend of mine who was in prison, and he got in trouble, something about drugs and money with the black guys. I understood that John Gotti got involved and squashed the beef. And uh, he worked things out to resolve the problem between my friend and the black guys. Now, the problem would have resulted in my friend getting a beaten because there was quite a few black guys, and he squashed it. I knew that. So when he walked over to me, Boozy said, Sammy, this is John Gotti. Johnny, this is Sammy. So Sammy the Bull? Yeah, yeah, that's me. I said, give John a drink. He said, Sammy, I hear a lot of fucking great things about you. Yeah, vice versa, bro. I, I know you just got out of prison not too long ago. I hear a lot of great things about you, too. And number two, I want to thank you. You straightened out a problem for a guy who knew me, a friend of mine who was in prison. And he said, yeah, yeah, I took care of it. As soon as somebody told me that he, he was your friend, I stuck my two cents in right away. I appreciate it, bro. I appreciate it. And I hear a lot of things about you, John. Knows I'm not introduced as a friend because he's not made yet. So that's what I knew about John Gotti. That's when I met him. And uh, it was probably, I think he got made in 1977, somewhere around that time. But it was about a year, year and a half after me. There was different times when I bunked into him or there was a problem and we were together. Then when he was made, I was introduced as a friend to him. So I got to know him better and better. But it started in around 77, and it went further from there. New York, 1977. I'm already a made guy in the Gambino family, super close with Tato. One year after I'm made, I become an acting captain. He makes me an acting captain. And uh, I'm with him all the time. When I got transferred, he told me to be with him all the time. I'm with him like, like glue. So one day he says, Sammy, we got to go to Paul's house. Drive me up there. Okay. So we go up there and we, the maid lets us into the house and uh, he's there. He's not as friendly as he always was and just something, I guess, was going on. I didn't know what. Tato stood in front of me. I stood behind him. And after shaking his hand and saying hello. And he tells Tato, after Angelo Bruno was killed, the boss of Philadelphia mob, a war broke out between Angelo Bruno's cousin, who was a captain, a very powerful captain, Johnny Keyes, and uh, Phil, the chicken man, Testa. A little while after Phil, the chicken man, Testa, was killed with a bomb in front of his house. He had brought Nicky Scafo in as his gunslinger. Now the war basically continues between Nicky Scafo and Johnny Keys. The commission, the New York commission, has ruled for Nicky Scafo to take over. Johnny Keys 
didn't agree with it. And the war is raging. There's a few murders back and forth. And now Paul is explaining what happened. He went to a commission meeting and they accused him of backing Johnny Keyes on a sneak. He vehemently denies it. He doesn't even know what they're talking about. And they tell him two made members in the Gambino family, Pal Joey and Nikki Russo, were seen meeting with Johnny Keys in a restaurant. So that's where the accusation is coming from. Somebody reached the commission and told them about this meeting. Now, Paul is explaining this. And when he denies it, they say, well, if you're not backing it and you're able, your people are able to meet with him, then we're going to make a commission hit. Very rarely ever done where the entire commission agrees and gives a hit out. And they give it to Paul Castellano. It's your hit. You take him out. He's fucking fuming. Pal Joey and Nikki Russo are with Tato Arella. They are in a Jersey faction, but they're with him. And I'm a young pup, just became an acting captain. I'm just there to drive. I'm just there to listen. And I hear this going on, and it's an incredible thing. Tato says, I don't know nothing about it. Paul is fuming. He said, then get them and bring them into a meeting. Look at the fucking position that these guys have us in now. We reach out for them. They come in, there's a meeting, another meeting. And this time we go to Paul again, Tato, me, pal Joey, and Nikki Russo. We tell them a little bit about it. They're real nervous. But they said they bunked into him, they knew him for years, they're all old timers, and they just talked. There was, you know, they knew about the war, but they didn't talk about the war with him, they're claiming. So anyway, we take them to the house. Paul is fuming again with them. He tells them what that meeting did and the position that we're in. They're literally begging him, Paul, we didn't talk about the war. We knew a little bit about it. Just the word of mouth. We didn't talk about it with them. We didn't back him. We didn't say anything. He says to them, well, now we're involved. He kind of looks over Tato's shoulder and he looks at me and says, Sammy, could you take out this guy, Johnny Keys? I'm dumbfounded. I know this is now a commission hit. I know how big this is. I know there's a war going on between two factions in the Philadelphia family. I don't know this guy from a hole in the wall. I never even heard of him, basically. But I answer Paul and say, I guess I could. I don't know where he stays, what he looks like, who he is. I would need some help in that respect. Do you need guns, money, or some shooters? No, Paul, I, I wouldn't need that. 
I have my own people I'm comfortable with. I just need direction, where he is, where he stays, what he looks like, stuff like that. He turns to Nikki and Joey and says, you're on the hit. You're under Sammy with this. Listen to whatever he says and do it. You know where he stays. Yes, we do. You obviously know him. Yes. And put Sammy on him. We leave the house, or I should say we're leaving the house. Paul touches my shoulder. Good luck. Be careful. The sky is no joke. I originally was in the Colombo family in the middle of a war, hitting the mattresses and all of that shit. And I understand it. I understand what they're doing, not what I have to do. Nobody likes it. What are we going to do? What, what can we do? I'm ordered to go on this hit. We got to take them out. Where did this meeting happen? We get in touch with Nikki and Joey. Where did you meet this guy? In a, like a small little restaurant. It's Friendly's, they call it. It's a commercial place. Friendly's is the name of it. They sell ice cream, hamburgers, all that shit. I'm going to meet you out there. Take me to the place. Show me this place. I go with Louis Melito. And uh, we go into the place. There's a counter when you first walk in. I tell Louie, I'll sit at the counter, dressed real casual, with a baseball hat, with glasses. We'll have Nikki and Joey sitting in the back. You will be sitting in a booth. I could see you sitting in the in that booth. When he comes in, you'll give me the eye. I'll get ready. As he passes me, I'll turn, I'll pull out a gun and I'll shoot him in the fucking head. You, get up, you'll have a shotgun. Start shooting in the air. Scream to everybody to get down. I'll have guys outside. Nikki and Joey, when they see him, they'll wave to him from the back. That's another thing I could see. I look at this restaurant. That's the plan, but now I'm in it. There's all kinds of men and women and kids. People take their kids to eat here. I sit at the counter. The guys go move around where I, I wanted them. They knew I would want them to be. And I just waved them back. Come on in. Come out. Let's get out. No, this is not happening here. We're not doing this. We're not going to kill this guy in front of all these people. We can't, we can't do this, bro. There's kids, there's women. We can't do this here. We're not doing this. We got to get a better place. They tell me a place that he has a small little pizza restaurant. In New Jersey, I believe. I make a decision, I want to go there to see him. Nikki and Joey says, you, you can't. Why can't I? Sammy, I mean, this guy's got 20, 30 guys around him all the time, all the fucking time. They're at war. And they're all heavy. 
They're all waiting for something to potentially happen. You can't. You can't go there. I don't know of any other way to do anything. You're not giving me any information what he does, what he doesn't do. I don't, I don't have a fucking clue. I still don't even know what the fuck he looks like. I saw a little picture. It was a little blurry. I don't know. So I said, go there. Tell him that Paul wants to send somebody with a message. Okay, we could do that. Good. Tell him the guy, they call him Sammy. He just got made not too long ago. Really, he's, he's a fucking punk. He's not a tough guy, he's a punk. But he brings messages back and forth that are very, very precise. So Paul uses him for that reason. So he would like to send this guy in to see you. And he is a friend, meaning a made guy. He agrees to the meeting in his place. A couple of days goes by, and I'm going in. My whole crew don't like it. We've passed it once or twice. We don't like this. There's guys all over the place. I got this, bro. B don't worry. I got this. We go that day. I am nervous. There's a mob of guys, young guys, big guys, and it don't matter, big, small, or indifferent, they got fucking guns. They're loaded to the gills. They're not looking to fight, they're looking to kill. I go in and I get to the front door. Nikki and Joey go in, a little bit ahead of me. And this big guy grabs me and, not grabs me physically, but gets right in front of me. He's bunking into me, pushing me around. You like it here, tough guy? No, I'm okay, I, listen, I, I was told to come here. I, all right, all right, calm down. I'm trying to act as scared as I can be. I have no weapon, I have nothing. I'm completely patted down, searched, very, very thoroughly, front, back, every place. But I have no gun. I go in, and as I'm walking in this pizzeria, I could see him sitting in a booth in the back. As I go, guys keep shouldering me as I pass them at me with their shoulder. One guy gave me a little push. Come on, hurry the fuck up. Okay, okay, wait a minute, take it easy. No bad remarks for me, no tough guy shit. I'm scared. I'm not as scared as they think. I'm not as scared as I act. Some of those bumps, some of that pushing, is I'm not too happy with. But the conditions call for me to act and conduct myself a certain way. I get in there, I get in the back. Nikki and Joey introduced me to him. He's a Gabriji, Angel Bruno's, Bruno's cousin. This is Sammy. He's a friend of ours. They don't say nothing about me being an acting captain. He's just, he's not making an ocean. He's a friend of ours. Made guy. I shake his hand. I sit down in the booth. He starts talking to me a little bit about the war what messages he wants me to take back to Paul Castellano. He apologizes that he's armed. We're not supposed to bring guns when we meet each other as friends. But he says, we're at war. 
right now. And I turn around and say, listen, John, I'm okay with that. Matter of fact, I'm glad. I mean, at least, you know, we're safe. I'm acting like I'm scared shit and that we're both safe. I'm there to kill him. So he talks a little more. We go back and forth. And uh, yeah, Paul, I guess, don't understand. He's talking about the Genovese people were scheming to do this. And he's given me all of these stories to bring back to Paul. They're, they don't mean nothing to me. They're insignificant to me. They're not going to go back to Paul. He questions me a little bit about what I told you a few minutes ago. You remember what I just told you? Now, I'm supposed to be a guy who brings back great messages. I'm supposed to be smart. I told him the thing, word for word, what he said, leaving out a word. When I finished, I apologized. I said, I left out this. He smiled. Very good. Very good. You are smart. I think you're everything that they told me. I smiled. I know they already told him that I'm a jerk off and a punk. We have the meeting and I'm about to go. I get bumped again in going out, bumped from side to side, little push. How'd you make out, tough guy? He's a great guy. I, I want to smash this fucking bastard in the face so bad, but I'm, I'm obviously not going to do anything. I just, he's a great guy. I appreciate you guys like a little cunt I'm acting. It's necessary. I leave the place, and my crew is not too far from there. Sammy, what the fuck? There was a mob of them, bro. What'd they say? What did he do? What this and what that? We went back, we met. I said it was all bullshit. There's no way for us to do anything in there. There's a bunch of guys before and anywhere before you get even close to him in the back. And they're all armed. Some places I saw guns. I'm sure they showed me those guns on purpose. But I saw them. Can't do it there. We got to do something else. And I'm struggling with this. I'm not sure what to do. Tato talks to me, how's it going? Great, great. W what'd you do? That's going great. I met with him. I saw him. I shook his hand. I met him as a friend. He's a, he's a captain. I'm a friend. They bounced me around a little bit. Everything I expected. They searched me. Everything I expected. It can't be done in this place. I got to do something a little different. <sighs> I think about it and I talk to my crew, along with Nikki and Joey. I want you to go back and make another appointment for me. What are you going to do? I'm going to tell him that we're going to join the war. We're going to make him win the war. Paul is going to back him. We're doing all these things. Nikki and Joey tell me, I don't think you should do that. Why? If he thinks you're lying to him, 
If he has any feelings or you fuck up in any way, here's what they're gonna do. They're gonna take you down the basement of that place. They're gonna torture you to find out your motives and what's really going on. And then they're gonna kill you. It's too dangerous. Make the appointment. When we go back, I agree with you. You don't come in with me this time. Stay on the sidewalk, walk across the street to the car where you can still see in to the place. If they forcibly take me off that booth, get in the car and get the fuck out of here. We'll come, you can't do nothing. Get in the car and get the fuck out of here. You're gonna be important for other people who are gonna come after me. You can't help me. My crew is fucking flipping out. This is bullshit. This ain't a fucking hit. This is like a fucking James Bond thing. Fuck them. Don't do it. Forget it. I got to try, bro. They make the appointment. I go back. I go through the same fucking bullshit with these guys. And I get to the back and I sit down. I said, I got some news that I think you're going to like. What's that, Sammy? Paul Castellano wants you to win the war. Paul Castellano is going to sit for you with the commission and back you. If you need money, guns, shooters, he's going to help you win this war. He's going to need one meeting with you, you and him, face to face. Tommy Bellotti will be there, that's his driver, you know that. I'll probably be there with Joey and Nikki. You have to be there alone. You have to be there with no gun. But you pick the place that you're super comfortable with, you know you're safe, and that you and Paul are safe from the other side, because you are in a war. I see him, his eyes are looking up. He's thinking. He's probably thinking, is this possible? Is this going on? Am I being bullshitted? I have to break that thought. So I tell him, John, I'm so fucking scared, bro. I'm paralyzed. Can I have a glass of water? My mouth is so fucking dry. Oh, get him some fucking water. Get him, get him some water. He's not looking up and thinking, I got him away. Getting me water. I broke his thought, I think. They bring me the water. Smiles and laughs a little bit. I know, kid. This is a little heavy. You're a little frightened. Don't, don't, don't be embarrassed. I, I, John, I'm not a little embarrassed. I'm, I'm so fucking frightened. It's crazy. I can't even talk. My mouth is so dry. I just gulped down a couple of gulps of the water. I got his mind off of whatever the fuck he was thinking. We're talking about something totally different. As Soon as we run out of words, his eyes go up just a fucking hair. And I tell him, do you have a place that's safe that you pick? Yeah, I do. A country club at this golf course. I go play golf there. Very fancy place. Security. The whole nine yards, that's a great place. 
tells me the name of the golf course and the country. I don't come from me, I never heard of it. Well, Mickey and Joe, we know the place. They'll tell you where it is. That's perfect. Now he's smiling at me. He loves his idea. I got him. I got him. I'm smiling. Finally. We both won. He got what he wanted. I got what I want. I get up. We shake hands and I'm walking out. That same cocksucker gives me a little elbow in, in my side. Knocked the wind out of me just a little bit. I didn't show nothing. In my mind, I smiled, but he didn't know what I was smiling about. What I was smiling about, I was smiling that I said to myself, I wish you could be there. Okay? And I leave. <sighs> My guys meet me, and uh, we don't like this, Sammy. Well, what the fuck are we going to do? We're going to go there a little later. We're going to go to that golf course. The King Joey knows. We're going to go in. you got a pass to get in. There's a guard house. We're going to go in. We're going to look at it, and I'm going to see where the fuck we're going to do it. going to be alone. Let's go to the golf course. We go to the golf course. There's a huge parking lot. We stop the car. We get out. I walk a little ways and I say, Nikki, Joey, right in this area, we pull in. That's where we park the car. We get out. And we start walking. Get ahead of me. I'll be walking behind you with him. None of us got guns. He's going to search all of us. You guys, there'll be a van over there, parked in there. You'll all be armed to the fucking teeth in this van. I will take a stutter step. So he'll be a fraction of an inch ahead of me. I'm strong as a bastard at that point in my life. I will grab him and pull him into me like a bear hug. That fucking door better slide open. All of you guys, like a SWAT team, pile out, grab him, and put him in the fucking van. We'll go out of here. We'll go down the road a couple of miles. We'll kill him, then we'll throw him in the fucking weeds. Nobody's comfortable with this, but we have no other option. What if he takes other guys? What if he wants to do this? What if he wants to do that? Then he can't come. The meeting is set for him and Paul. If he wants to bring somebody, I'll tell him absolutely not. Paul will meet with no one but you. And then you take it from there. It's done. Everybody's got a spot. Everybody's ready. I do have a gun. I don't keep it under my belt or on me. I put it under the seat, wrapped up way under the seat. He comes out. The place is packed. Pal Joey is driving. I'm in the passenger seat. Nikki's in the back behind Joey. And Johnny Keys is going to get in right behind me. Everybody's in the seat. He opens the door and gets in. Puts his hands over the seat. He grabs every single part of my body. Sit up a little bit. Stand up. He's got his hands on my butt. Every part of my body he touches. He looks at the seat. Looks at everything. He even touches them. Okay, great. 
Let's go. We take off. Some of those guys wave to him. We go there. We go past the guardhouse and we're in. We park exactly where I told them. We get out. The truck, the van, is parked exactly where I said. Nikki and Joey are ahead of them walking. Me and Johnny are in the back, talking as we're walking. The same exact spot I said I would take the stutter step, I did. He must have been three or four inches ahead of me. As he said, just before that, he says, Sam, look at that van. I look, yeah. He says, there's some smoke coming out. It looks like it's running. I take the study step. I grab him in a bear hug. The door comes flying open. Guys come running out. He was lying. He didn't have a gun. He did. His hand was now on his gun, but he couldn't get it out of his pants because I had him really, really tight with all my might. As my guys came over, he tried to kick his way out of it. It didn't work. I said, he's got a gun. We pick him up off his feet. We go to the van. I never let go of him. I jump in the van backwards. I land on my back with him on top of me in a bear hug. Get the fucking gun out. I can't get his finger off the gun. Break the fucking finger, get it off. Get the gun. The gun comes out. Pal Joey gets the gun. Puts the gun on him. I yelled to him, don't pull the fucking trigger, fucking idiot. The bullet will go through him, I'm, I'm under him. Joey gets in the car. I told Nicky Russo, which was the plan anyway, go back, take the car, and follow us out. We have him nailed down in the car. Even pal Joey's in there with us now. We turn around. We step on the fucking yes. The truck turns around and hits the little rail onto the grass. Every, the wheels are squealing and we're going. The guardhouse, the stick is down. Go through it. Go fuck it, go through it. We go through it. The fucking piece of wood just explodes when we hit it. We go sideways a little bit. We hit into the fucking guardhouse a little bit, sideways, the side of the vehicle. And we're back on the road. Hit it. We're out. Nobody's following us. Nothing's happening. There's some activity. You could see it in the back. There are people just running around. No one, I guess, half of them saw it or they don't I don't know what went on. I didn't give a fuck. Just go. We're, we're gone. We're in the country. There's woods. I said, well, go up a little further. Go down the road. Make sure nobody's following us. Pal Joey says, oh my God. Oh my God, what? What? What's the matter? And he dangles keys in front of me. I got the keys to the car. Oh my God. Nikki Russo's still there with the car. It's our fucking car. My gun is in the fucking car under the seat with my fucking fingerprints all over it. This thing just happened. They'll find this guy dead. They have the car. My prints are all over it. We're dead. Oh my God. Stop the fucking van. We stop the van. Get out. We're in the middle of nowhere. I don't give a fuck. Get out. Go run. Go jog. Go wherever the fuck you got to go to get in touch with Nikki. See if he's arrested, if, if they found the car. Find out what the fuck happened. And then get back to me. You guys, get this fucking truck going with him and let's get on the fucking true way and go back. We have plastic 
ties. His hands are tied together. His feet are tied together. We're looking at him. He's looking at me. A kid. A punk. And he laughs. A punk, huh? I got a feeling you're doing what fucking four families couldn't do. Five families, if you want to count our family and the, the whole commission. Couldn't do. You got me sitting in this fucking van. Sammy, I killed over 50 people in my lifespan. I'm a hitman's hitman. I can't believe what you just did. Sounds like he's complimenting me on a fucking hit. And he's the guy who's going to get hit. Yeah, all right, John. We'll go in. Now, he tells me, this may be the greatest fucking hit that took place, but you fucking up a little bit. Yeah, how am I fucking up? The back windows. Those big trucks, tractor trailers, passing. They all have these CBD things. They'll see me sitting in the back, tied up, and all these other guys in here, they'll see in, and they'll call the cops. I look at the windows. He's right. He's right. Get something. Get some graves. Cover them fucking windows. He's right. This guy's telling me how to do a hit on himself. Why the fuck would he do that? I can't, I just, I, it's not registering. We're going in. All of a sudden, he says, Sammy, go in my pocket in the front. I got some pills. What kind of pills? Nitroglycerin pills. I'm feeling pain in my chest. I don't want to die of a heart attack. Give it to me under my tongue. It's got to stay there. Every five minutes, put another one in front, especially if I get worse. I'm doing it. This man's worrying about a heart attack. What the fuck kind of guy do I got here? What the fuck is this man like? What's... I'm dumbfounded. He's making sure I don't get arrested by blocking windows. He's complimenting me on work I'm doing. He don't want to die of a heart attack. He's now asking me to loosen up the, the ties a little bit. And he's talking to me. I did that to him in the restaurant. Is he doing that to me? Does he have a surprise for me? He's got 50 hits. And he's... He said it, but I heard it from other people. Nikki, Joey. He was a beast, a top, top hitman for Angelo Bruno for years and years and years. We're going to come by a toll. And I said, John, I'm going to have to hold you down with a couple of these guys and I'm going to cover your mouth until we get through the toll booth because there's these guards. He said, you don't have to do that. He said, I mean, this is our business. Fuck the cops. This has nothing to do with them. This is goes on Austria. You're living goes on Austria maybe like you'll never live again. I have to do what I got to do, bro. I can't take that chance. Okay. We got him, everybody, Louie, everybody. We got him wrapped up like he couldn't move enough muscle. And at the last minute, I put my hand over his mouth real hard. He doesn't move a fucking muscle. No squirming, no nothing. 
I get through. His words are ringing in my ear. This just goes in Austria. This has nothing to do with the fucking cops. He's not going to resist. He says, Sammy, I got to make you an offer. But I got a lot of money. I can make you a rich man. Please, John, don't. You, there's no money in the world. Like you said, this is goes in Austria, bro. There's no money. Money, you don't, this, it don't exist to me. Especially right now. Please don't. I'm starting to develop a respect for you. How you're conducting yourself. I don't know if I could be like this, what you're doing. And how you are. I don't think I can act like that. So don't do that. Great. Well said. Done. We talk back and forth. He asks me for some favors. Could you do me some favors, Sam? I'm starting to like you. You're and I didn't like you too much when I thought you were a punk. <laughs> You're the furthest thing from that. And for your age, it really goes in Austria, through and through. I like that. I wish you were part of my crew. He said, if I got to go, make sure the guy who pulls the trigger, if it's not you, Make sure it's a friend of ours. One of these guys is a friend of ours. Done. Take my shoes off. Don't let me be found with my shoes. Why do you want to do that? My wife is always worried about the life and worried about things. I'm going to die in the street. More or less like you're going to die with your shoes on in the street. And I always told her, don't worry, I'll be home. I'll die with my shoes off. It'll mean something to her. She'll know that I was thinking about her in her final stages. Oh, my God. Done. Done. What the fuck kind of guy is this guy? When you talk about somebody being a man's man, I got somebody here acting like I can't even explain what he what he was or how he was acting. We get back into Staten Island. Louis Melito has a friend who has a gas station. There's a dirt road going down, no blacktop, just little rocks. And in the back, you can pull in and leave your car there. And there's a yard behind that and everything like that. So we go there and we pull in. John, do you want something? We're going to stay here for a while. Why, Sammy? Why are we staying here? I don't want to tell him, really, that I didn't get an answer with the car and I'm waiting on an answer for that. That's just the last thing from this guy's mind now. I said, the order has not been given to me to kill you, just to snatch you. They're talking. Maybe they'll call. Maybe they'll tell me, let him go. Maybe they'll tell me to kill you. I don't know what they're going to say, but that's what we're waiting on. He buys this, lock, stock, and barrel. I guess that's his only hope anyway. I sit in the van with him. I let everybody get out, go to the corner, have coffee, buy bagels, do what they want. Stay, leave them alone. The fuck away from them. I make them as comfortable as I can. 
I'm sitting with a, a gun on my, a 357 Magnum on my lap. <sighs> There's a code. When they come back around the truck, they gotta hit the truck twice. One, twice, I know it's one of them. And I don't react. And he's talking to me about the life. He's telling me about Angelo Bruno and the murder of Angelo Bruno and who he thinks did it and what was involved in all his years of growing up and so many different things. We're talking like two buddies who haven't seen each other for a bunch of years and we're rehashing everything that happened. I'm amazed at some of the shit we're talking about and things. But he's 100% goes in Austria. More than I think anybody I ever met in my life. I'm actually starting to like this guy. <sighs> and uh, all kinds of things. I get word back that Nicky Russo got away with the car. Joey went there. They didn't hassle him. They didn't hassle the car. They didn't know the car had anything to do with what we did. Cops came, there were people there, and nobody really knew what the fuck happened. It looked like a fight, or they, they don't know what happened. Then the car crashed when they were trying to go away a little bit. So nobody, nothing happened. But I'm not gonna do nothing until they're back over here in Staten Island with the gun, with everything, before I do anything. Every once in a while, I get a, call, a cup of coffee, a bagel, I give him coffee. I got his hands in the front so he could get the coffee, he could drink the coffee. And I'm trying to make him as comfortable as possible. I don't want to be brutal. I don't want this thing to be brutal in any way, shape, or form. I know this probably sounds crazy, but I don't want that to happen. I hear somebody walking, and he hears it too, on these little pebbles coming towards the truck. No knock on the truck. I get the gun, I cock it, and I put it towards the window. Nikki and Joey come. Everything is cool. You got my gun? Yeah, we got it. We got it in the car. All right. I said, nobody come in the truck. Stay out of the truck. I want to talk to him. I go back in the truck, and I'm... John, I just on the call. You, you lost the decision, bro. I got to take you out. I'm gonna make them come back in the van. I'm gonna take you in the back. There's some weeds and stuff back there. And uh, I'm gonna kill you back there. All right, Sammy. You're gonna live up to your word with the shoes. Everything, every, everything. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna treat you right up, uh, like a man right up until the last second. There'll be no pain, there'll be no suffering, there'll be no fighting, there'll be nothing. I have the utmost respect for you. As much as I can love somebody in goes in Austria, I love you. I really do. It breaks my fucking heart what I'm about to do. But you understand goes in Austria, I think, better than anybody I ever met. And I think you understand it. I'm choking just thinking of this fucking thing again. It kills me every time I talk about it. So we all get back in, everybody's quiet. We take them in the back near the Staten Island dumps and there's weeds and high grass and stuff. All right, pull over over here, we pull over. We get out, the door slides open and I hear him, Sammy, Sammy. I turn around, Joe, Pal Joe, he's got him by the leg and he's trying to pull him across the van. Get your fucking hands off him. 
Johnny, want to slide out by yourself? Yes. Get your hands off him. Let him, and he rocks his way forward to come out of the van. He gets out of the van and he says, where do you want me to go? Just walk into the weeds at three or four feet and uh, bend over. Louis Melito. This is Johnny Keys, Amiga Nostra, Agaba de Jean. This is Louis Melito, who's a friend of ours. He's gonna take you out. He'll do he'll be the shooter. Thank you, Sammy. He's taking me. He walks over, he bends over. Louis Melito with a 357 Magnum, I believe it was, that he had. He hit him in the head. His body is down. He hits him two or three more times. Everybody gets in the van. We're all sick. We killed the epitome of our life that night. We all felt that. We all had so much fucking respect for him. It was like real, a real family member that we killed a family member or something. We got back in the van and left. Everybody went home. The next day, it was in the newspaper, mobster from Philadelphia, high-level mobster from Philadelphia was found, killed gangland style and blah, 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 all that bullshit. I had to go to Paul's house, uh, which I did. I went there, rang the bell, op opened the door to maid. As I'm coming in, Paul got up. He read the paper. He's running always, all excited. Grabs me, hugs me, kisses me. Oh my God, Sammy, you, you, you're the best. I don't say a word. What's the matter? For me or my crew, none of us are happy about this. This guy conducted himself that we killed the epitome of our life. Somebody that we're supposed to hold in high esteem. We killed him. He's taking Paul back a little bit. Anybody else would have did what you did would be on cloud nine. You know why? No. Every boss, every underboss, every gunslayer is going to know that our family carried this out. You, you, Sammy, they're going to know you carried it out. Nikki Scarfo is going to know you won the war for him. You did it. But you're not happy about it. No. Why? I don't give a fuck what they know. Well, if they're happy about it or whatever they know, I don't care. I know I killed the epitome of our life. This guy should have been the boss, as far as I'm concerned. And I just feel guilty. I feel dirty for what I did. He looked at me. He hugged me. He kissed me. Don't ever change. Be you. What you are right now, stay there. Stay in that aura. Think like you think. I love you. you. But understand, you did what you had to do. You did what Goza Nostra told you to do. You're a man's man. But feeling like that and being man enough to say it, I think the world here. Stay like that, bro. 
He asked if I wanted coffee or anything. I didn't even want coffee. I didn't want nothing. So I said, I'm just going to go back. I got some guys waiting for me, and if you don't mind. So we got over that, and I left. That's the story of Johnny Keys. New York, 1977. A lot of people ask me questions about my crew. How did I pick them? How did I build the crew? I didn't intentionally go out and pick people to build a crew. Some people I knew and grew up with and were around for years and years and years. I knew their families. I knew different people from the neighborhood who knew them. Stymie came to me one day and he became one of my right-hand men. Really super tough guy. Somebody came to me and said, this kid Stymie in Doc's bar had an argument with McIntosh last night. They actually pulled guns on one another. McIntosh was an Irish guy who was a Carmine Persico. I knew him from when I was with the Colombo people. He was deadly. He was deadly. I knew as soon as that was told that he'll come back and kill Stanley. For sure. No question. So I told the guy who told me about this argument, I didn't know Stanley. I said, he's dead, watch. A, a week, a month won't go by, he's dead. They both pull guns on each other? Yeah. And then they laughed and they both walked away from it. Yeah, that's exactly what Mac will do. But in a matter of weeks, Sammy will be dead. Mark my words. Then he told me, he said, Sammy, this kid's a good fucking kid and he's got balls. He's really a good guy. I want you to meet him. I went down to Doc's bar. I heard his name once or twice, but I didn't know. I went down to Doc's bar. I was introduced to him. I was made already. He obviously wasn't made. He was, Doc, he owned Doc's bar. We had a couple of drinks, we talked. I instantly liked him. I asked him about the beef with Macintosh and, and him. And he says, Sammy, I know he was a tough guy. I know he was with the Colombo people, but I'm not no punk bitch. I'm not going to let anybody do to me what he did. If I got to die for it, I'll die for it. That night, he opened up his thing, showed me a gun. I opened up mine. I got one too, motherfucker. What do you want to do? And we both pulled the fucking guns. You know Macintosh? I know of him. And I know who he was, I, you know, but I don't know him personally. Do you know how tough he is? How much work this guy's done? I've heard. And you still did that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather die a fucking man than live as a coward. But he hit a fucking bell in me that I said, I'm gonna help this kid. I went downtown in Carroll Street where the Colombo stayed. I used to go there myself and I went there and there was Macintosh outside. I walked over to him and said, hey, Mac, what are you doing, bro? Hey, Sammy, how you doing? How's everything going over there? Meaning with the Gambinos. Good. I hear good things happen for you. Now he's not a made guy, I'm not supposed to discuss that. So I just said, yeah, yeah, a lot of good things are happening for me. And uh, I gotta talk to you about something. What is it? I said, you went to a bar in Brooklyn, uh, in Bensonhurst. You had a beef with this guy, Stymie. He's pulled guns and this and that. He's talking, he's smiling, he's laughing, and I'm talking, I'm smiling. I said, bro, I got this kid under my wing. I want to apologize to you. I heard what happened. He didn't know you from a hole in the wall. He's a tough kid. 
He's with me. When I told him who you are, he, you know, felt bad about it, but you showed him the gun first, bro. This kid's a tough kid. And he didn't know, he's not showing you no disrespect. He didn't know you. He's not gonna let nobody do that. All right, oh, I got it. No, you don't have it, bro. He's with me. Do I have your fucking word that you won't hurt him? That's what you want? That's what I'll trust. I want your word. I want to hear you say it. Don't, let's not just blow this conversation off and he dies next week. I'm going to take that very personal. I'm going to take it like I killed him. I goaded him into some being relaxed for you. If you want him dead, tell me. Sammy, the way you're talking, bro, I love you. You know that. I give you my fucking word. I won't touch him. It's over. But you're right. I would have killed him. That's all I needed to hear, bro. I love you. I grabbed him. I hugged him. I kissed him. It was over. That's how Stymie wound up with me. When I got done with Macintosh, I went right back to the bar to meet him. I told him, stop carrying the gun. The thing is over. But you got to listen to me from here on in. What I did, I put my neck on the line for you. Don't act like no fucking cowboy doing stupid shit. I read him the right act. He became so loyal to me over the time, years. He became one of my top shooters. He was for real. Another guy in my crew, the old man Peruta. The old man Peruta, I knew him already for years. Great guy, street guy all his life. He was older than us. He was 59 years old, I think, when I was in my 30s. And he was with Tato. He had cancer and was dying. I made Peruta on his deathbed. John was in jail. I sent word to John, he's dying of cancer, I want to make him. John said, go ahead, get some captains, put him around his bedside, prick his finger, take the blood, do the ceremony, and make him die as a friend of ours. That's exactly what I did. Peruta was a shooter as well. He always looked like an old raggedy old man. And that's what we used to call him, the old man Peruta. Even though he wasn't that much older than us. He would kill somebody for me as fast as somebody would get me a cup of coffee. If I said, do me a favor, get me a cup of coffee and Guy would walk over. Well, that's all I had to do with Peruta. It was no different. There was a guy, Michael the Bat, who was part of my crew. I knew his father, Mackey. He was a gambler, in debt all the time. And I always used to take care of him. Just get the wolves off of the door. You know, if you don't pay me, I'm gonna break your face. Leave him the fuck alone. And I used to tell guys, but he was, that, that was him. There was guys like that. He wasn't a tough guy. He was just a neighborhood guy who's always seemed to be around me and ran to me with problems all the time. And I took care of some of those problems. When he died, he had a, a, a big debt. He had a little bar on 18th Avenue all the way down. I think it was his daughter or someone came to me and said, they're going to his wife and his kids and going to collect money that he owed. Who's doing that? A bookmakers, some street guys and stuff like that. I didn't think that was right. I got in the car and I went to his house. I went to the funeral. 
for respect to the family. I knew the wife. So I went and talked to her. There was this big kid there. He was in college, football player, big serving a gun. He was ripping mad that guys were there. He wanted to defend his mother and this and that and all this shit. His sister was there, a daughter. I said, listen, listen, please, all of you calm down. Roseanne was the, I said, Roseanne, keep quiet and go sit next to your mother. You, big guy, keep your mouth shut. You're not gonna do nothing. You're physically big. When these guys come, if you do something stupid, maybe you could win. You look like a tough kid. You're gonna get hurt. You have no idea what you're fucking with. So be quiet. Then I told her, from here on out, Whoever comes here for money, for because that Mackie owed the money, say, okay, don't argue. The lawyers, don't argue. Just tell them, Sammy's paying those debts. Go see Sammy. Send them to me. That's all you got to do. Don't argue. What are you going to do? Michael said. I'm going to not pay them, number one. And I'm not going to let them body your family. Your family, you guys don't owe these people money. Your father gambled. That debt dies with him, as far as I'm concerned. But let me handle that. That's my business. That's what I do. I'm not going to fight with them like you want to do. And I'm telling you, you won't win. You may win a fist fight, but you won't win. That's what I did. She called me back, I went back, and she said, Mackey's bar, this little bullshit bar on 18th Avenue, it was a shithole, really. She said, they, we don't, we're back in the rent and this and that. I want to give it to you, if you want it. I said, yeah, yeah I'll take it, I'll do something. I was going to open an after-hour club with this place, so I took the club. No money, no transactions, nothing. A little while after that, this kid, Michael the Bat, came down to talk to me. I want to be with you. Yeah, go to school. Someday we'll talk. I quit. I got a little injury. I quit. I don't think it was the injury, but... He wanted to be there for his family, and uh, I guess he liked what I was doing. Whatever. Long story short, Michael the Bat hooked up with me and was another guy who was 100% with me, physically very tough. Eventually, he came on work with me, and just as good a shooter as anybody else. So my crew was building and getting stronger all the time. And it had a reputation. One example I'll give you real quick. I was made, my crew was by this place, Docs, and uh, John Gotti was made now. Not too long. John Gotti came down with a couple of his guys, and he went to Doc's. I wasn't there. And he started asking these guys about his sister's daughter, who was banging a few people. And he's getting a little rough. So Stymie tells him, listen, this is Sammy the Bulls joint. I don't know about what she does, what she don't do. I don't even know you. If you have a problem with your niece or whoever it is, it's not over here with us. And I'm telling you, he told him two, three times about that this is Sammy's place, knowing that it should be respected by another made guy or whoever the fuck John was, he didn't know him. John continued with his mouth. Stymie looked at Michael the Bat, eyeballed him eye to eye, and nodded his head like that. That's all it took with Michael. Michael the Bat went in, 
there was a sort of shotgun under the bar for the bartender if there was ever a problem. Michael DeBat bartended once in a while. He went right in, got the shotgun, put it under this long coat. One or two guys peeled off. They were loading up. John picks up on it. He's not really stupid. And he calms down. John says something more. Now they're all loaded. My guys are loaded. Stanley tells him, listen, I told you four or five times this is Sammy's joint. We're with him. Now get in your car and take a fucking walk. I'm, not, I'm gonna stop talking nice to you. Get the fuck out of here. John smiles and as he's walking away, oh, you wanna be a tough guy, huh? Go in the car and leave. He leaves. Then John comes to me and tells me the story. They told me the story too, but I went back after John's story. I heard both sides. And I said, Stanley, do you know this guy's a May guy? I heard. You heard he's a May guy and you did that? Yeah. You can't do that. Sammy, fuck him. He can't do what he did. Nobody could come here and fuck with you and think they're gonna walk away like nothing happened. That's stymie again. I can't even be mad at him. I put on a bullshit act. Well, don't ever do that again. Walk the fuck away, it's no embarrassment. Walk the way, we'll get, I'll take care of it later. But I walked away with my chest sticking out four inches. My crew were fucking beasts. They didn't fuck with nobody. They didn't try to hurt people. They helped people. But if you fucked with them, you could die. And that's what the entire fucking mafia got to understand and learn. This was no easy fucking place especially if you came there to fuck with Sammy. You might die there. So that's how I built my crew. I didn't go around looking for people to sign them up like it's a job. They fell into place here and there. Some of them I knew a long time. Some of them I felt what they were about. I just didn't pick up guys for numbers. There was a guy, Joey. I hung out with him when I was a ramper growing up. Him and his brother went away on a drug charge or whatever they did. They got 15, 20 years. 15 years later, he comes out of prison. And so I'm now not docs, I'm in tallies. And somebody comes and says, Sammy, this guy, Joey, Joey Senna was his name. Joey Senna's in the front, he wants to talk to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. So I went to the front, hey, Joey, how you doing? This and that, yeah, I just got out and this and that and whatever. I went having that kind of conversation. How's things going? Well, not that good. I just got out and broke and, but, I, you know, I'd like to come around you and hang out. I hear a lot of things about you now. Yeah. I don't know what you heard. You've been away 15 years, bro. I haven't seen you in 15 years. I heard a few things in jail. You fucked around with drugs, put some shit in your nose, right? I don't know where you're coming from anymore. What I'm gonna do, hey, Huck, come here. Huck was another one of my guys. And I lean to his ear and I tell him, go get 5,000 in an envelope. Huck comes back, 5,000 in an envelope. I said, here, Joey, put this in your pocket. Maybe this helps you. You know, and I can't put you with me. I got a crew. I haven't seen you for 15 years. I don't know if you're an informant. I don't know if you're wired up right this fucking minute while you're talking to me. I can't expose my people to you. I don't know where you're coming from anymore. Hang around the neighborhood. We already got a head start. We know each other as kids. I'll hear everything you do or don't do. 
and eventually maybe one day I'll call you in. Maybe you could hang around me. I need time. I can't make that snap decision because I knew you years ago. All of a sudden, you're part of us. I can't do that, bro. These guys have been part of me for years. I know their wives, their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, their aunts. I know when they took a shit. I know who, who they fucked. I know everything about them. There's no hidden secrets. I don't, I, I, I think the world of you. You're a tough guy, you're a good guy. But I don't know those secrets anymore. There's 15 years of secrets that I don't know. Maybe you should think the same way. 15 years later, maybe I'm a different guy than when we grew up. I might be a motherfucker. You don't know that, right? No, I know you're not. All right. Give it time, bro. I never took him back with me. But that's what my crew was. I didn't go out just picking guys or picking guys for money. Most of them I got were broke eventually. I helped them make money before I wound up getting money through them. So that's what my crew was, and that's the reputation my crew had. Frankie the Chico knew them all. He loved them all. They loved him. So we had a lot of things, and that's what my crew was. When John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero got in trouble with the boss of the fucking family, I'm one of the first guys he came to for help. That's another story I'll talk about a little bit down the road. New York, 1982. Yeah, 1982, I, I was doing great. I mean, I was doing construction. I had a good, close relationship with Paul Castellano. Everything was flying high. Everything was good. I got this uh, disco. There was a few partners, and they had this disco. I bought the building. My office was underneath. It was My office was a 5,000-square-foot office. And right on top, on the second floor, there was a club, the Plaza Suite. I had bought the building, and uh, it was uh, really good. I was running my construction businesses out of there, and everything was going good. Two guys, a guy named Vinny Sicilian in the Colombo family, a made guy, and a guy named Salty from Coney Island, another made guy. I don't remember exactly. I think he was with uh, the Genovese people, but I'm not 100% sure. They had these kids. They were with them. The Plaza Suite was under their protection. They would give them a piece of it. There was two of the partners really weren't with anybody. And they came to me with a problem one day. <sighs> that, that, that they were having with Vinny Sicilian and Salty. So I said, what's the problem? And they were being bullied a little bit. These guys were putting in bounces and all kinds of stuff. And the bounces weren't doing the right thing. And they're fucking around with the girls. They weren't really working. And these two guys couldn't really make them do what they wanted them to do. So uh, I went to sit down with uh, Vinny Sicilian first. And I told Vinny that these two kids were with me. I understand you got this other guy. He's with you. And Salty's got another guy. I'm coming into the place. There's a lot of things I don't like about it. I own the building. They're right on top of me. They're not listening. You got a couple of bodyguards you put in there that think they're the bosses and they just fuck around with broads all night and they don't do their job. So uh, before I go and step to these guys, I want to show respect and come to you guys and tell you that I'm here now. And I want to ask if you have a problem with that. No, Sammy, no problem at all. You could take full control. All we do is we sit, you know, we don't even go near the joint. And we just get our end every week. 
We don't do anything. So you go in there, bro, control the whole joint, do whatever you want. Oh, great. Great, I appreciate it. I'll make sure you get your end every week. I'll make sure that you're getting your legitimate end that these kids ain't bullshitting you and I'll know what's going on. Okay, great. So I go to the place. I walk in with some of my crew. Stanley, Michael, the bad, about four or five guys. I walk in with. I called the bouncer over. This big guy. I said, uh, I forgot what his name is, but I talked to him and I said, uh, there was a fight the other night. You didn't even break it up. What happened? He said, first of all, who are you? I said, I'm Sammy, I own the building. I spoke to your men, and I'm gonna run the place now. So here's who I am. I'm the guy who told, who's telling you, get the fuck out, you're fired. You're not gonna work here no more. You don't have the right to do that. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. What I'm gonna tell you is go to your man, go complain to him, don't complain to me. Get out. I fired, I think, two or three people right away. I threw them out to show them I was in control of the place. These two guys, they were more timid than the ones I took. I mean, they were pounding their chest. They loved it. So I took over the place and I brought in Michael DeBat. I made him the head bouncer. I made Huck a bouncer. I put three more guys in the place, bartenders, from bartenders to running the place. This guy, Joe Skaggs, I made him the general manager who was going to book any events that were going to go on there and run the place and make sure the bills were paid, make sure everything was paid, and all the money would go through him and whatever Salty or Vinny Sicilian's end was, he would make sure that it was put on the side and it was sent to them with my knowledge. Now, I was involved with a lot of construction, so I wasn't interested in going. It was a disco type of place. But I did go on a Friday. The place was packed. A line around the corner. And I, first time I went there at night, usually I'm there during the day with my office. I really didn't go to the place. I went in, looked around, it was gorgeous. Really, really well done, well lit, the lighting, everything was beautiful. So now I was controlling it. There was a guy sitting at the door who collect the money when you come in and he'd let you in. There was a rope there. Real fancy, really nice place. So I told him, they pay you the money? Yeah. And what are you supposed to do with it? Well, then at the end of the night, I do this and I do that. How come you put it in your pocket? Well, that's where I put the money. There's no box or something that you put the money in. You put it in your pocket. You ever get confused whose money it is? Whether it's yours and mixed in with your money or to the place. And he laughed and giggled. Sometimes I laughed too. I said, that's great. I used to do this when I was younger. Sometimes I used to get confused too. Now, I didn't actually call it confusing then. I was robbing a few bucks for myself. So I called it robbing my boss. You know who runs this place now? Vinny is salty. Nope. Nope. I run it now. And I don't know whether to call it confusing, robbing, I don't know what word to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you work in another part of the place. Cleaning up or doing a few things. There's a few chores that you could do. I'm going to leave you on. 
but Huck is going to collect the money at the, at the door. I'm not going to clean. OK. That's your choice. So when you leave, don't let the door hit you in the ass. Don't come back unless you want to clean. That's your job. So now he's gone. I'm controlling the door. I'm controlling the whole place. It's running smooth. There's no fights. The bouncers do what they're supposed to do. The waitresses, everybody does what they're supposed to do. A lot of the waitresses I knew from the neighborhood, so I knew some of them. There was entertainment. This Joe Skaggs would get the entertainment. Everybody was running smooth. Everything was going great. Eventually, Joe Skaggs came to us, me, mainly, and my guys. And he had a guy named Frank Fiala who wanted to rent the place on a night that we're closed. In other words, we operated Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He wanted to open the place on a Wednesday and throw himself a birthday party. It sounded strange to me. I said, why, why would we do something like that? And Joe Skaggs, I called him in, and I was talking with him, and he said, Sammy, it's an off night. I could get people coming in, and uh, we'll make, you know, a nice score. He's going to pay for the booze that they use. He's going to give us X amount of dollars to have the place open. I mean, we could make a, day, a good day's pay out of it. It's a bonus. We're closed on that night. I said, all right, handle it. So he started making arrangements to do this, right? Then I started hearing rumors. The guy who's renting this place, I believe he was Czechoslovakian, and he was in charge of the Czechoslovakian mafia. Never heard of it. Didn't have a clue who they were, what they were. He was a multi-millionaire. He had a yacht, his own plane, all kinds of stuff. And he had this shipping company that if a ship in the ocean gets stuck, they would call his company. He would fly mechanics, parts, and all kinds of shit down to this ship, fix it, so it could keep sailing. Uh, he, he was in a position he was making a huge amount of money from that. It's a tremendous business. And I'm not talking about little boats. I'm talking about major ships, oil sh uh, tankers, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And there isn't very many companies that do that. And he's also in the Czechoslovakian mafia. Again, I never heard of it. So what does he want to do? He wants this party, he wants to bring in 300 people for his birthday party. In the middle of the night, he's going to sit in the middle of the dance floor and have women shave his head. He's going to buy food for them. He's going to have a raffle. He's raffling off a boat, a motorcycle, a car, all kinds of things. Now my greedy ass crew heard about this raffle and immediately they're talking to me about rigging the raffle. Let's rig it. How are we going to rig it? Now we'll figure it out. <laughs> I said, is that why you want to do this here? This guy seems strange to me. Why does he want to stop the whole place and shave his head in the middle of the place? Sounds nuts to me. Well, he is a little nuts, but uh, big Coke dealer. He's got, a, he's got like an entourage of people following him all the time, they're telling me. 
Given Broad's coke as much as they want, whenever they want, he had a pack of people following him all the time. I'm starting to think maybe we shouldn't rent the place out. And Skag says, you know, we could deal with it. We're going to have, you know, we'll put all the guys on, Michael the Bat, all the bouncers will be here. We could handle it. I said, all right. But I'm curious. I want to meet him. I go to the place, and there's supposed to be a meeting in the Plaza Suite. It's closed. It's during the day. And I go there. And he's just buzzing around. He sounds and looks like he's stoned out of his fucking face on coke. He's talking a mile a minute. He's got women coming over, sitting on his lap. It's, it's just weird. The whole thing is fucking totally weird. And he's not making sense. All kinds of things he's going to do. He wants to bring in bands from Europe and this and that. And so I'm saying, well, we, we, we have a, 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 a DJ. And I didn't say we, I said they. They have a DJ and you could use their DJ. We don't need no bands like that from Europe. I'm not going to go. This is a one night thing. This isn't going to be a lot of events and this and that. He don't want to hear nothing. He wants to do what he wants to do. What kind of food, what kind of catering are you going to bring in? Chinese food. We're going to have Chinese food brought in for the whole 300 people and this and that and everything. So I grabbed Joe Skaggs and my guys, my brother-in-law Eddie's there and Stymie's there and Louis Melito was there. I said, come on, let's get the fuck out of here. I think this guy is nuts. So I grabbed Skag, Skaggs. I said, listen, something is wrong with this guy. It's, it's, he's not normal. Something is wrong. Did he give you a check? Did he give you a deposit? Did he give you money on this thing? Oh, yeah. Sam, he gave me a you know, nice size check. All right, then, then do it. But uh, I'm a little concerned with this. I let the thing go. There's a couple of more meetings and things are said. It's more insane every meeting gets worse, not better. He's got people going with him on his plane, on his private plane, and he's flying them around. It's like a jet set type of thing. Not, it's weird. The whole thing is weird. I'm starting to worry about it. So I have a talk with my crew, and I tell them, listen, come Wednesday when this place is going to open, you know, there's going to be a few guys, Michael and Huck and a few guys and... 300 people, if they're anything like him, I don't know if they can control all these people. We don't know who they are. You know what we should do? Maybe we should all go. Every one of us, go. And we'll get a couple of more guys, neighborhood guys, tough guys, uh, you know, hire them for the night. Let's, let's get about 20 of us in there to back up in case Michael about has a problem or something, let's all go. And that's what we do. That night comes, there's about 20 of us. One or two guys are armed. I feel I could take on an army. 300 people don't come. 100 people come, if that. And all kinds of weird shit going on. Guy is dancing on the dance floor, takes his pants down, and everybody's cheering, clapping. They're family members of his, supposedly. 
We're sitting at different tables. I said, this is fucking nuts. I knew this fucking thing was going to be crazy. I said, look how crazy this is. He did get on the dance floor. Somebody shaved his head. The things he was supposed to raffle and bring outside the club, the motorcycle, the car, nothing was there. So when I talked to Louis Molito and them, this is a fucking scam, bro. This whole thing is a scam. I bet you that Joe Skaggs didn't cash that check. I bet you that check is going to bounce. Something's radically fucking wrong. They bring in Chinese food. There's no utensils, no forks, no spoons, nothing. A hundred fucking people eating with their hands. I never seen anything like this in my life. I think I want to leave. I said, I think I've seen enough, bro. I want to get the fuck out of here. I never seen anything like this. This is a circus, bro. I feel like a clown that we're sitting here and this is a, a joke. One or two little fucking fights break out amongst them. The bouncer strain it out in two seconds. No big deal. We just sit back. Not a big deal. Nobody interfered. Nothing happening. It's, it's a complete circus. I don't even know f- what words I could use. I don't know if it's 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, listen, bro, I've seen enough, had enough. I got Skaggs is over by the table. I said, I guarantee you that check. You didn't cash it? No, no. That check is gone, bro. That, it'll bounce. This whole thing is just fraud. It's a fucking fraud, bro. They made a fool of us. No, no, Samuel, see, he's, he's a millionaire. I don't give a fuck if he's a millionaire. He's just fucking nuts, too. So anyway, they go to him and they tell him, the night is over. You got, we're going to close. He tells them no. No, I'll tell you when we're going to close. What's your name, he tells me. I said, the last time I met you, don't you remember I met you? No, I don't remember nothing. I asked you what your name is. I go like this with my hands. I want my guys to sit down. I do not want something to erupt in this place. It's a fucking gold mine. We can get through this. I just go like this, and otherwise my guys know when I do that, Calm the fuck down. So I said, my name is Sammy. We met before, but that doesn't matter. Maybe I'm a little drunk. No, I'm not drunk. Well, listen, I understand. They told us that it's going to close. We, got, we all got to leave. I'm not leaving. I had a little bit of, like, I had enough of this fuck. I tell him, no, bro. Take it from me. You're going to leave. You're going to leave. It's time for the place to close. It's a business. You, they tell you you got to go, you got to go. It's over. You had a whole night, you had fun. There's shit all over the place. You have people eating with their hands. There's stuff for food all over the fucking place. The place is a mess. Get the fuck out. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I'm, I got him up to my eyebrows already. I have enough of him. I don't, He leaves and walks away from me and walks to where he is. He goes into a bag, gets a bag, and he gets something out of the bag, a piece of metal. It's not a gun or anything like that. He walks over to me, and he says, I'm a hero, and he's got this metal, like a war medal or something. I says, I mean, I'm not interested in that. And he throws it at me, and it like bounces right off my chest. Three of my guys spring to their fucking feet. I says, I said, sit down. Michael pulls them away from me right away. I said, Michael's got bags over there. Go through those bags. I said, he says, I went through the bags already. What's in them? He's got a gun. I took it. 
It's, it's, it's in my waistband. Good. You got no other weapons than that? No. Okay. I'm going to walk out of here because I think I'm inciting this fucking thing. I'm making it worse. I'm going to walk out. Tell him. He left. The place is closed. You have to stop. Skeggs, put the fucking lights on so that the whole thing stops. Stop the music. Stop everything. It's over. I'm, I'm going to be right outside. You, Michael, or Huck, if something breaks out, come down and call me right away. I'm going to walk out with four guys. I'll, I'll be right back in. I leave. We're parked a half a block away. We're watching the place. The place is emptying out. Now, it started when it got to maybe 100 people. Maybe there was 50 left at that point, and they're leaving. I get a signal that they're gone. There's only my people there. Michael comes over. He called you everything under the sun. Good. Good. Remember Luca Brazia and the Godfather? I told Michael. Yeah, when he went to go meet the other side. Yeah, 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 that part. Stay close to him, like you're his friend. Badmouth me. Tell him you don't like me, you hate me, I think who I am. Stay close. Let him open, get in his, get in his head. See what he's thinking, what he's saying. I want to know. All right. The night is over. Friday morning... Joe Skaggs comes and he tells me he's insulted that we closed the place. He's insulted about things that you said. He wants to buy the whole building, the disco, the building, everything. He knows your office is down. He wants you out. He wants to buy you out. He wants to buy me out. Yeah. Tell him it's not for sale. Well, wait, Sammy, let me just tell you what he said. What? He wants to buy me out. Yeah, but he wants to give you a million dollars to get out. He wants to give me a million dollars. Yeah. Now, the building is worth, back then, maybe two, two fifty, three hundred thousand. The disco could have been worth that much in itself. So you're talking maybe five, six hundred thousand if you got somebody who wanted to buy the whole thing. He's, he's at a million dollars. More than the building is worth, more than the club is worth. And that million dollar, my greed bells started to ring. They went off. Tell them I'm not interested in the money. If the number was a hell of a lot more, I might be interested. And I don't want to talk to them. You guys talk with them. You talk with them, Skeggs. There's a dialogue going on. Goes up to, I think, a million three fifty, a million five, whatever it was. I said, okay, you'd have to go to lawyers and bring lawyers in and whatever. This is not. He agrees. By Monday, late afternoon, early night, we agree to a number. And we, got, we agree to a meeting is going to happen for him to buy this whole thing. And they're telling me that they're showing me articles that he's legitimately wealthy, he has this shipping company, he has all this bullshit he's got. And he does own a fucking plane. Now, Friday comes and goes. Saturday, I have made guys from three different clubs on really the other side of Brooklyn come looking for me. Hey, pal, Ali Shades, one of the guys. He was with the Genovese family. He was a made guy at this particular time. He became a captain. And he says, Sammy, 
Bro, we, we got the club over here. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't remember the name of the club. Yeah, I know. Why would you do something like that last night? What did I do? What are you talking about? He said, we had a nice little line outside the place and uh, a helicopter come out and a guy with a bullhorn is screaming through the bullhorn, don't go to this club, go to the Plaza Suite. <laughs> I started laughing. I says, bro, do you think I would do that? This fucking nut came to the place, wants to buy the place. I guarantee it's this fucking maniac who's doing it. I wouldn't do that. You think I would fly around with a fucking helicopter telling people where to go to a club to dance? Come on, bro. This is how it starts, and it gets fucking crazy. Three different clubs, three different clubs were controlled by mob people are coming to me now. I got to go see him. I go see him. Frank. You went around with a helicopter, yeah, yeah, this is the best club, you gotta, this is what you gotta do, you gotta advertise, you gotta do this. So I, you can't do that, they're my friends. You can't do that. You, this, this isn't Czechoslovakia, this is Brooklyn, New York, you can't do that, you can't do it. Now, if we're gonna make a deal, we gotta go with lawyers, we gotta do it very quiet, we gotta do this, that, and the other thing. He says, I could give you the money, I could give you some money under the table. Cash. Good. Good. I'll take 600000 under the table, and we'll leave us a balance of eight, nine 900000 I'll even give you a little break if you can do that. He could do it. He meets with my lawyers. I wish I remembered a place. Kiss. His lawyers were talking to buy KISS radio station, whatever it is. That's a big station. This guy really is loaded. And his, his lawyers are in some sort of negotiation. It's crazy. It's getting crazier and crazier and crazier every single day. Now, he meets with my lawyers and Right in the meeting, I mean, he don't even try to keep it quiet. I'm going to give Sammy 600000 in gold. Goes to Czechoslovakia with me on the plane. I fly it in. I do this. He brings in an army truck, and we unload. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not doing that. What the fuck is What do you think? This is a James Bond movie? I'm not doing that, bro. Now, first of all, I'm not going to Czechoslovakia with you. That's number one. Or uh, I'm not getting on your plane. And I'm not coming in with no army truck to pick the fucking gold up. He makes an appointment down in Manhattan in a bank, a foreign bank. I'm so fucking twisted now on this money. I go to this bank with my brother-in-law. We have two suitcases each. I want to go in there and walk out with five, six hundred thousand dollars of gold. I think I lost my mind doing this fucking thing. This guy made me crazy. They would have gave us the money, the gold. But they wanted us to sign documents and papers. So this is supposed to be money under the table. I'm not going to sign no documents and papers. Long story short, we walk out with nothing. One insane story after the other is going on. The meeting with my lawyer, he don't show up. Something happens, this happens. The check, by the way, from that night in the Plaza Suite bounced. We never got that money. I'm having enough of him. I'm, I'm growling at him every once in a while when he talks to me. I don't like the way he talks to me. I don't like the way he talks, period. And uh, he comes around with a little pack of people all the time. Like some of them are bodyguards, some of them are girls, some of them are... I'm not crazy about this guy at all. I, I don't even like him. Forget about crazy about him. I don't like him at all. He's just like a complete psycho. 
I get a call. My sister worked for me in my office. And she says, that guy that you're dealing with, this nut, Frank Viella, yeah. He's in the place. He came in our office and he told everybody to leave. It's his building. And he has people breaking the wall where the staircase going up is so that from the office, you could just go into this back stairwell that goes up into his place and he's making it like Fort Knox. And he's took over your office. He's sitting in your office. I said, that's a little too far. I said, hey, let's go back to the office. There's a problem. I tell my sister, tell all the girls and everybody to go home. Just go home. Get out of there. Get out of here. Don't listen to what he says. He's a fired. Just get up and leave. Don't argue with him. Leave. I'm afraid he'll liable to hurt one of them or do something. So I go there. I walk in there. The girls are gone. He comes to the door. He opens the door for me to come in. And he says, come with me to my office. And he's walking to the back. That's my office. He makes the turn into my office, and me and my Bon Laveri are following right behind him. He gets behind my desk, he opens the drawer, and he pulls out an Uzi machine gun. My brother-in-law is dark-skinned. He was as white as a fucking T-shirt. He, we thought we were getting hit. Told us to sit down. I sat down, my whole body tightened up, waiting for these bullets to come in me. I thought for sure I'm dead. My brother thought that too. And he was talking. It gave me a second to think. If I was gonna get killed, he's gotta pull the trigger. He didn't pull the trigger, he's talking. So I started talking fast. Frank, what are you doing, bro? We're gonna meet with the lawyers tomorrow. We're gonna straighten this out. There's a couple of little bullshit hurdles, I mean, Come on, bro, put that down. What are you doing? You know, I mean, I know you, you're aggravated. I mean, you sure? You, you people, you people, us greaseballs, us this, us that, he's calling me. All right, all right. You know, we, we sometimes we're a little aggressive. I know, we made a mistake. I apologize, but put that down. Come on, bro. We're going to talk with the lawyers tomorrow. Everything is going to be cool. You take, mark my words. We got this. Uh, you're fixing the place. That's good. I love the, the way you're going to go right up into the place from here. That's great. That's a great idea. He tells us to leave. Me and Eddie get up and we're walking through the hall. I'm still tight as a drum. I'm thinking maybe he'll shoot me from the back, but he don't shoot. I open up the door. As I'm opening the door to go out, I says to Eddie, get all my guys, tell them to meet me in docks. Sammy, would you shut the fuck up? I'm not asking for your advice. Tell everybody to meet me now. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna kill him tonight. Now, I don't want, I'm not asking you for advice. Keep your fucking mouth shut and go make some calls. And I go. I don't have time to go to Paul Castellano or do anything or even to title. I don't want to involve nothing in this. I get my whole crew and then some. I tell Michael the bat. When I'm going to kill him, you stand near the door. You're the bouncer at the door. You start screaming to everybody, oh my God, they have guns, so go upstairs. Make everybody run. Grab the door and hold it closed. Huck, you do this. Louie, Stein, get around to the side of the building. When he comes out the office and walks around the corner and is coming towards the door for the Plaza Suite, me and Eddie will be standing right there. The signal will be when I say, Frank, 
How you doing, buddy? You two guys run out and start shooting. We'll all have guns. You, Nikki Cowboy, you pull up with a car as soon as this is done. The shooters will jump in the car. You take off with them. Another guy, he pulls up. Everybody dump their guns in there. He's going to walk with a pack of people. Whoever makes a move after the shooters move, towards us or towards them, kill them. I don't give a fuck who they are, kill them. <sighs> that night, everybody was in place. Crash cars, getaway cars, cars that took the guns to dump that, car that took the shooters, Michael the Bat Hawk controlling the in and out of going in the Plaza Suite. He came around the corner with a small entourage of guys and people and women. He was in front of the pack. Me and Eddie were about 25, 30 feet away from the door, leaning against the parked car. As soon as he got about 30, 40 feet away from me, he turned and looked at me. I said, hey, buddy, what's up? He took a step or two towards me with a grin on his face when the two shooters came out. They killed him in a matter of seconds. He got a multitude of shots in him, blew both of his eyes out blew the top of his head off, hit him in the chest. He was gone instantly. A huge puddle of blood dripping down immediately. Every man there went for their gun. Our guys, my guys, f looking at their guys. They didn't know what the fuck way to run. They, weren't, they didn't have guns, they didn't try to have guns, and if they had them, they didn't try to pull them out they would have got hit in two seconds. The girls just didn't even, again, flop and didn't know which way to go. In a matter of minutes, the cops were there, pulling out of squad cars, pulling out yellow tape, putting yellow tape all around the crime scene. Some people got away, some people didn't even get away. Me and Eddie didn't get away. We were the last guys to move. The car came and took the hit team and left. The car just missed being stopped when all my guys, me and all my guys, put the guns in that car. That car disappeared. So me and Eddie were stuck. The reason why they showed up so quickly, the night before there was some sort of a racial incident. The cops were afraid there was gonna be racial problems. So they were cruising all around the neighborhood. I guess the second they got this call, they notified the police cars, and that's why they were there so quickly. Yellow tape and cops all around. I gave Michael the bat the sign. Unlock the door, go back upstairs. Cops wouldn't let anybody move. People outside, standing on the sidewalk, they were looking for witnesses and whatever the fuck they were doing. I said, let's just try to walk away slow. We pulled away from the car and started moving. The cops said, you just gotta stand where you stand to freeze. We froze. A girl, a couple of girls, but one of them, they parked their car in the parking lot. And I guess they were gonna go to the plaza suite just before they hit. One of them, start talking loud as she's walking towards this barrier. Sammy, I parked the car, are you coming? So the guy said, who's that? I says, that's my girl. She just parked the car, we, we got out before, you know, and she parked the car and I walked over here. 
Did you see anything? He didn't have a clue who the fuck I was. I said, no, I didn't see none. She came right through to Barry. Come on. I said, oh my God, something happened here. What, what the hell is going on? Did you see anything? No, we just pulled in. That was there already. Oh my God. She carried on like an actress. The cop says, okay, go ahead. You and her and my brother, you just could leave. I put my arm around her. I kissed her like it was my girl. I said, I'll never forget that. She said, you know my uncle. Of course I know your uncle. This is what I would do, and I think the world of you. You know, I, I hope I got you out of this. Listen, I really wasn't even in it. I wasn't going to tell her that I was involved in this thing. I said, I, just, I actually walked into the fucking thing. I don't even know what the fuck happened. So I wasn't in trouble. But what you tried to do, you thought I did this, right? Yeah, I did. I didn't. But what you tried to do, I really appreciate it. Never forget it. Someday I'll see your uncle soon. And uh, I owe you big time. Just for your attempt. But I had nothing to do with it. I wouldn't admit to nothing. We got to our car. She gave me another kiss. This was a real kiss. And I let her go. That opened up the door to a multitude of investigations. A bunch of things happened. I did get $350,000 in cash under the table before we concluded the deal. We did have another quarter of a million tied up in legal bullshits. But I had a lot to do now. I had to go down. They took our liquor license. The club immediately closed down from that hit, never opened again. I immediately had to go to Vinny Sicilian I started with him. I said, bro, a multitude of things happened. I heard about all these things, Sammy. I wondered how long you would take it. It got to a whole nother level. Sammy, fuck the joint. I got a little piece. You're my friend. I, don't even explain it to me. I don't give a fuck. Fuck the club. I gave him a hug, kiss on the cheek. I went down to Coney Island, went and see Salty. Told him the same thing. If you feel you lost money, if you feel there's a number that I owe you, bro, uh, say, man, you're crazy, don't even do that. We're brothers, bro. And you did a great fucking job. Fuck the joint, fuck the money. That's Cosa Nostra. They both walked away from the club, the argument, the beef. Didn't want to argue. I blew the club, blamed me for anything. Nothing. Took my back and didn't want a penny. The government was different. The government was all over me. Investigations were flying all over the place. I saw Frankie the Chico the next day. I told Frankie the entire story like I'm telling you. Actually, it was so fresh, I told him every detail. The next day, it was in the newspapers. It was blasted all over the place. Ties to the Gambino family. He must have been a millionaire. All this fucking... Stuff there's in newspapers in every place about him. There's articles popping out who he was, what he was. And when they came after the next day to, that they took his body and cleaned up the office that he was in, there was three or two or three 
Doberman pinches attacked dogs that he had in there already. He was bunking himself in. There was weapons in there. He was going to make a fucking military base out of this thing and fight me, fight the Italian mafia, fight us grizzballs. Didn't work out for him, but he lost. But I was in trouble. Frankie came back to me and reported to Paul. It was the same exact as it was in the newspaper. I've never seen a uh, newspaper be that exact, but he brought the exact story back. Paul was accusing me of doing a hit off the record, not asking for permission. Sammy had it wrong. He had to come to me. I'm the boss. He needed my nod. I don't want to meet him. When Frankie tells me the story, he said, Sammy, if he gives me your ticket, or he gives it to anybody in my knowledge, all I'm going to say is, don't meet me. Don't meet me means there's a hit on me. I would know that. I got my whole crew up to my farm. I congratulated them on their loyalty and what they did. I said, I have a problem with this. It's not your problem. You've done nothing wrong. Anybody who don't want to be here and stay with my problem, and I don't blame you, leave. Leave now. We'll always be friends. Matter of fact, you guys who leave, if anything happens, take care of my wife and my kids. Don't try to get even. Don't try and do anything. So I want some of you to leave. It's not cowardice. I want you to leave. Those are the guys who leave. You're responsible for my wife and kids. The guys who were going to stay, I told them, go home. Load up. Don't come here with pistols, the heavy stuff, shotguns, Uzis. We're going to go to war. I did the right thing by protecting Paul, and now I'm being accused of breaking the rules. I might get whacked for this. I can't accept that. I was in a war with the gallows. I knew what it entailed. I knew what would happen. I actually knew we couldn't win, but I was convincing myself we're not going to go down easy. Me and my guys were in trouble. When you come, you're going to be by my side. We're going to take a note to each other. We're all going to go down together. It's not going to be easy. We can't win. So understand, whenever you go get shotgun, an Uzi. We're all going to die for what I did. You don't have to come back. No one. No one left. Not one. My whole crew, 10, 12, 15 strong, stood there. I said, I need some of you to leave, not be part of this.
no one would leave. I stayed 19 fucking days before Paul Castellano was willing to meet me in a restaurant in Manhattan. Him and Tommy Bellotti wanted to see me and Louis Melito. Louis Melito was one of the shooters. He knew that. I met him. And in this, he told me, what you did is did work off the record. You didn't ask permission. I said, Paul, what I did, you know the entire story. I'm not going to tell you again. But what I did, I made that decision. I knew you would give me permission for everything he did. For me to have that happen, come up to your house, meet with you, knowing the FBI is watching you, they would see me walk in, and then this would happen in the plaza suite. I was afraid that they, if they put two and two together, they would link it to you. That's why I sent Frankie after, and I didn't come myself. Because it was linking this whole fucking thing to me. I tried to avoid putting you in trouble, involved in this thing, that there was a direct meeting before and a direct meeting after. He says, you're not the only tough guy. Tommy Blatty's a tough guy. He's got a gun. I said, he don't need a gun. You want me dead, Paul, for what I did? Give the order. Give me the gun. My car's parked outside. I'll go right in front, and I'll blow my fucking brains out. When you walk out, you'll see that I conform to your order. One of the reasons I did that, I was thinking, if I go to war, I can't win. Me and my crew will die. They did nothing wrong. They followed my orders to the T. They risked their lives. I thought back with a guy named Johnny Keys. The night he died, he taught me Cosa Nostra in a whole different way, in a different light. He taught me how to die like a man. It was my turn to die and to die like a man. So I was taking the weight by saying that. I'll die, my, I'll kill myself, I'll die in the car. I knew at that point, my crew wouldn't be touched. They would be satisfied. If that's what it took, that's exactly what the fuck I would have done. You could never, ever do this again. You always have to ask me my permission. Louis has his hand on my wrist now. We're out of it. We're going to make it. I said, I can't make that promise. If it comes to saving you, and I'm going to go because of that, then so be it. Louis's now kicking me in the fucking leg like, Paul is smiling. You do have fucking balls. You do have balls. Even Tommy Bellotti is not smiling, but smirking and nodding his head. As if to say what I just said is right. That's goes in Austria. I'm supposed to protect you. You're the boss of the family. You can't tell me not to protect you. That would be a cowardice fucking move. And I'm not a coward. 
I may not be the toughest guy in the fucking world, but I'm not a coward. <sighs> he huffed and puffed a little bit. It's over. The Plaza Suite thing story is over, but not quite. After a while, I did get indicted. Me, my brother-in-law, and a few other guys. The people who made the money flow to 350000 to me. A check cashing place. We did all kinds of things to get that money turned into cash, and I got it. The trial went on for a while. My accountant came in and took the stand. My lawyer asked him, he didn't pay taxes on that money, right? No. But the following year, he attempted to pay taxes. He told you to pay the tax, right? Yes. There was a crack in the case. At the end of the trial, my lawyer, Jerry Chagall, very famous lawyer, asked the jurors, Mr. Gravano's got an eighth grade education. I don't know your education level, but if you go to an accountant to pay your taxes, and the accountant says, don't pay them this year, pay them next year. Would you not listen to him? Or would you just pay him whenever you feel like it? And people are like nodding as if to say, yeah, of course I would listen to the accountant. The accountant actually bailed me out when he made that statement on the oath. What the accountant said on the stand, on the oath, what the lawyers did, we were all found not guilty. Not just me. But the IRS barreled in and wanted the money. Of course, now I'm actually admitting I got the money. I got out of it by saying I didn't pay it then. I got it, but I didn't pay it then. I paid it here. So I beat the tax evasion case, but now I owe the money. I owned a 30-acre farm, horse breeding and training farm at that time in my life in New Jersey. The government was taking my house that I live with, my wife and kids, and or the farm, until I paid everything. I decided on selling the farm that my loved, my, my wife loved it, my children loved it. We had it for a, a couple of years. That was my, my way of leaving the neighborhood and having a, a family normal life, my getaway. I had to give it up. I sold the farm for a little over 350000 I took that money and some other monies that I had in the bank. I paid all my lawyers' fees, taxes, and everything, and I was broke again. Seems like the story of my life. As a kid, my family growing up broke. I went to riches. And I went broke. I came back and I went to riches. And then I was broke again. New York, 1985. Things were going great. In the beginning with Paul, I loved the guy, he was great. And I was earning very well under him and everything was going good. And everybody basically thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. 
But Paul did a lot of things that started deteriorating and cracking that wall of love or whatever you want, or loyalty, whatever you want to call it. He's becoming more greedy for money. When he got arrested, the newspaper showed that he made gross $52 million a year. That's just from one company. And he had a multitude of different companies and, you know. So Paul was different than Carlo Gambino. Paul was more business-wise, more greedy in a way. And uh, the, the, the underlings, the, even the different families resented some of these things. Then there was tapes with John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero, and that set off big problems. So Paul's problems were growing by the day. The most loyal people to him, he would do something to them. He owed me 40,000, never paid me. The mafia was falling apart, in our opinion, me and Frankie, especially our family. We all knew what went on, the tapes, all this stuff, we all know what happened. I saw D.B. one time. He was a made guy in the family, eventually became a captain. D.B. said, Angelo Ruggiero wants to see you. Could you take a ride out to uh, Queens? And he gave me the time. I said, yeah, I'll go there. I got in the car and I drove out there. I saw Angelo on the corner. I pulled over, I parked the car, I got out. I walked to him, hey, Ange, how's everything going? I already know about his problems. How's everything going? Okay, Sammy, he says, I need to ask you for a tremendous favor. Whatever I could do for you, bro, what? What do you want me to do? I need you to help me, we're gonna kill the boss. You're gonna what? We're gonna kill the boss. Who? Who's gonna do it? You? Me, John Gotti, I don't see John Gotti. I just see you. Where's John Gotti? Well, you know, Sammy, he's, you know, he's doing something in, you know, I don't know nothing, bro. You're asking me to kill a fucking boss and I gotta know, you don't even have an answer for where the fuck he is. In other words, is he asking me to kill the boss too? Of course, we're together. Then why ain't he here? What is this, just some bullshit message? Could you pick me up a container of milk? You're talking to me about killing the boss. Listen, Angelo, I don't want to talk about it. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get back in my car. I'm going to go straight to Staten Island over Frank and Chico's house. And I'm going to tell him about this conversation. I'm not going to tell nobody else, but I'm going to tell him what you're telling me. You got a problem with that? No, no, Sammy, he's going to wind up being with us. We're going to reach him. Yeah, all right. And that's what I do. I get back in the car. I drive to Staten Island. I go to Frank and Chico's house. We go in the backyard, and I'm talking to him about what just happened. We're kicking it around for an hour, two hours, three hours. They dealt drugs. They broke every rule under the fucking sun. They got caught on tape talking about the commission, about the bosses, about every fucking thing. They half destroyed the mob with those tapes. So now it's being dumped in our lap. Should we kill the boss and save them? Should we just sit back and let them duke it out and see who wins? That's not my style. That's not Frankie's style. We're not going to do that. Frankie says, it's gotten to the point where Paul, I think, Sammy, we should kill Paul, save John and his whole fucking crew, and make Gozanosha what it used to be. 
it's deteriorating. Maybe this is a time to change it. If the hours of conversation, if that's what you want to do, he interrupted me. Sammy, everything we talked about, and don't forget what he did to you and your family. Frankie, I'll never forget that. What's stirring around in my head is maybe it's time for me to get even for what he did to me and my family. But I didn't want to do that, Frankie. I wanted to be Gozenostra about it. Everything that he has done, killing a captain, the Connecticut captain, allowing Chin to do it, because he was annoying to Chin. So many things he did. That's what I really need. All of it. I don't forget the other part you just reminded me of. I'll never forget that. So Frankie, I'm gonna agree. If you're part of it, and all of this background, I'll be part of it. One condition, Frankie, I want you to be the boss. He don't deserve it. Him and Angelo broke every rule in the book. We're saving them. We're not in trouble. Why should he be the boss? Sammy, I could be his underboss. He can't be mine. He's got an ego like the Empire State Building. You know that. We'll have problems from day one. Let him be the boss. I'll be the underboss. You'll immediately be a captain. In a matter of months, you'll be the Gonzoyer of the family. We will be the power behind the throne. We will teach him how to run this family. If he doesn't do it right, if he acts the fool, if he thinks this is a joke, I give you my word, we'll kill him. I'll become the boss, and you'll become my underboss. I look square in his eyes. I'm in. I put my hand out, and we shook on it. Now it's time for me to become someone in another war. Not the Colombo War, not the Gallo, Profaci, Colombo War. This war. It was time. I said, Frankie, if that's what you want, I'll agree. I think it's time that we change Go to Nostra. Truth or damage to the truth.